Given that there is a quorum of the town of the town council of Amherst present, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6:30 a.m. p.m. Um, we have several announcements. They are on the agenda, which is in the back of the room. Uh, there is a particularly to make note of tomorrow night at, at the Bang Center. Um, I think this is incorrect. It says it's in the town room, but that's not correct. It's at the Bang Center. Uh, tomorrow night at 6.30 at the Bang Center, we will have uh, the public hearing on the FY20 town budget. Um, the, and that will be a committee of the whole as well as the finance committee, which is officially convenes that meeting. On the 23rd, the finance committee meeting will um, meet in this room at two o'clock to discuss capital improvement program and the CPAC recommendations. The committee will meet again on the 28th at two o'clock. Actually, we've moved that meeting to one o'clock. Uh, no, that one is at two, but the meeting on the 28th is at one o'clock. And that will also be in the town room, and that's to vote uh, for the Finance Committee to vote on the FY20 budget recommendations. And then finally, on June 10th, uh, we have a, meet, a public forum on the capital improvement programs, and that will be in this room at 630. Um, would you please put the timing of the agenda up? Okay. And we're going to enlarge that slightly for those of us that are aging. Thank you. So I've actually uh, continued the practice of trying to put a time frame on our meeting, but I'm also using this as an opportunity to show you that I'm taking a few things out of order. So the first thing we will do is in fact move on. We do not have any hearing. We do have general public comment and we will take general public comment as soon as I am finished with explaining the agenda of order. We will then move on to 5A and then later on return to B. We will then move on to action items 7B and then on to appointments 8A and B. And then we will return to the rest of the agenda in the order that it appears. I'm doing this basically to accommodate both a personal need on the, of a member of the council as well as audience who may be here to comment. Um, so. Let me begin by asking, are there any people who would like to make public comment at this time? Okay, let me ask that when you come forward, you say your name, where you live, and uh, we're going to restrict you to three minutes. Thank you. Please come forward, gentlemen in the back. If it's not on, then you need to turn it on. Now. Now it's on. Thank you, sir. All right. And I have a comment about appointments. Is this the time or uh, will no, there be? actually, that's going to be later so on. So there'll be another public comment. Thank you. Are there any other public comments at this time? Okay. Then moving on, we're going to um, ask Amy Rusik. Rusi, Rus, Ruseki. I got it. <laughs> wow, I should after all these years. It's all um, good. Amy is the Assistant Superintendent of Operations at the Department of Public Works. However, tonight she is presenting us with a proclamation as the President of the Massachusetts Water Works Association. Thank Please. you. Um, yeah, so um, I, as Lynn explained, so I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Public Works. I, I have come and I've spoken to at least some of you guys. Um, about what Public Works does. Uh, a couple of weeks ago was Drinking Water Week, um, and as the president of Mass Water Works Association, um, I accepted on behalf of drinking water operators everywhere um, the governor's proclamation on Drinking Water Week, and so I wanna, you know, tonight present that to you guys. Um, and, I, and I will just, if I can make a little comment on it, um, much as it's not Drinking Water Week anymore, this week is actually Public Works Week, and so I think it's really fitting that we're here today to just kind of shine a light on these people that 
have a, you know, have a hand in all of the public infrastructure in the town. So um, I'll read this proclamation and then turn it over. Thank you. Um, so a proclamation. Whereas our health and standard of living depend on an abundant supply of safe, clean water, and whereas water is a precious natural resource that is vital to both the environmental and economic well-being of Massachusetts citizens, and whereas water protection and conservation help ensure that future generations will have a safe and abundant supply of drinking water, and whereas the ever-increasing need for potable water makes it incumbent on all citizens, businesses, and industries to practice water conservation as a cost-effective means of extending existing water supplies, and whereas through public awareness, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts seek to remind people about the value, importance, and fragility of our water resources. Now, there, therefore, I, Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim May 6th through 10th, 2019 to be Drinking Water Week and urge all citizens of the Commonwealth to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance. And it's signed by uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the secretary of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you. Our next agenda item is actually 7B. It's the local option community impact fee on short-term rentals. Mr. Bockelman. Um, thank you. Um, so the, this was presented to you a couple weeks ago. It was then presented in a more detailed way to the Finance Committee and to the Community Resources Committee. It was where, to which it was referred. And I think tonight you are to hear the report from those committees and to hear their recommendations to you. And I think they concurred on three motions that they're recommending to you tonight. That is correct. Uh, Andy Steinberg from the FinCom Committee. Yes, um, you have, will have received in your packet a report from the Finance Committee that we submitted regarding the, our recommendation. So um, I can be very brief since, uh, of course, I assume that everybody read it. Uh, but um, just in case, if not, the critical point is that uh, after uh, examining the uh, question in general and trying to make sure that we fully understood the law and uh, his chair I did take the step backwards and actually look at the statute as passed by the legislature. Um, we discussed it and concluded that indeed Amherst is impacted by short-term rentals. Uh, renters use town services, benefit from infrastructure and services, and may have some impact on housing available for other types of rentals. Um, and therefore, we recommended <coughs> Um, all three motions that were uh, referred to by the town manager. Uh, the first one, um, you uh, must pass in order to be able to touch the other ones. It's a sort of a critical first step, um, and that is to um, accept the community impact fee and apply it to um, what are transfers of professionally managed units, which are um, units that are rented out without the owner occupant being um, also a resident in the same building, that, which is what makes it professionally managed. Um, the impact fee can be up to 3%. We um, don't look at the amount as being that significant. It is paid by the renters um, and is a reasonable request. And we did recommend the 3%. If you pass the first motion, then you're permitted to um, consider and pass the second motion according to the state statute, which applies then um, the same fee uh, to um, two or three family dwelling units that include the primary um, 
the operator's primary residence. Uh, that's for the Airbnb type establishment where the um, manager owner is just renting a part of a house in which he or she lives. Um, and then the, the second, the, the last motion that we're recommending is that um, a motion of 35% of the community impact fee uh, collected under this uh, provision would go to infrastructure projects and affordable housing. Um, the um, statute, as we discussed at the last time this came before the meeting, applies to, uh, it has to be a minimum of 35% going to it. We put 35% in there um, as the number. Um, anything, we don't know how much will be collected. This is um, a first enterprise for us. We um, therefore uh, don't want to get into um, a guessing game about how much there is to distribute and uh, would prefer and recommend that it remain a part of the future budget processes. Thank you. Uh, for the Community Resource Committee, Steve Schreiber. What he said. Uh, uh, we supported unanimously the, basically the recommendation of the Finance Committee. Okay. Uh, this is an item in which we've posted as having public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll move to further discussion within the council. Then let's move to motions. Um, the first motion is, and we will take them in, I'm sorry, Darcy. I had some fun today at home watching the committee meeting where this was discussed. And um, just wondering if we would want to expand the second motion to include all short-term rental units, because um, I know that Andy brought up the fact that it, it misses that, um, that whole category of short-term rental units that are um, not owner-occupied. Mr. Bachman. Uh, the, law, the enabling law does not permit that. So this is the language that is permitted under the, under the law that was, that was passed by the legislature. Okay, one more question. Sure. Uh, so um, once, we, um, once we pass this, if we do, um, does it come back for reauthorization yearly, or is this, this is it? Um, Mr. Bachman. Thank you. Uh, no, it does not. This is, you're, you're adopting this, and this will be there um, until you repeal it. Okay. Pat. I've said this before, so I'm being redundant, but I would like to see more than 35% um, go to affordable housing. I'd like to see 50% affordable housing, 50% infrastructure. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Okay. Are there any other comments? Yes, Alyssa? I'm very sorry if this was covered in the report and I'm just not finding it or hearing it, but I'm wondering why we have to do the motion at all on the 35% because that's the minimum required by law. So why do we even need that motion? Are we just doing it for clarity's sake? I believe it's because that motion then applies to R3%. That, that, that motion require, it is required to apply to R3%. The only, the only motion I would have thought we would have needed for item three would be if we wanted it to be a larger percent. If we wanted it to be a larger percent, we would have to vote that. We don't have a choice. If we take, if we do the okay. first two things, okay. it has to be 35%. It, I'm okay with it saying that just to show everybody that's where the money's going, but I'm just clarifying that that's the only reason we're doing it, is to show everybody where the money's going, not because it's any different than what the law compels us to do if we don't increase it to 50% or 42% or whatever. Any comment on that, Mr. Bachman? So, by passing this, it gives you the it, it, it gives you the maximum flexibility, so that that other sixty five percent can be allocated to affordable housing or infrastructure or anything else that the council chooses. Um, what this does is it clarifies for our accounting department where how you, how the funds should be accounted when it comes in. If you did nothing, they would probably have to do that anyway. But this gives clarity, and the council will have spoken on how they want them this these funds handled. So it doesn't come back to you at another time. 
Thank you. Mr. Ross. Evan, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I actually wanted to build off of what Pat said, because um, my, my thought from our last discussion is that it, it's very, we don't know how many units this would apply to. Um, it's likely a fairly minimal amount. Um, and so the, I don't imagine this will generate a huge amount of revenue. Um, and so I'm curious, given that 35% is this the floor and not the ceiling, if there was any discussion in either CRC or finance about the potential to expand that beyond 35% um, to increase the amount of money that could go towards these two things that are impacted by short-term rentals. Andy from Finance Committee. Well, we discussed it to the extent that we recognized, I think, what uh, Alyssa had indicated that it wasn't necessary to do this. We wanted, we did it um, for the reasons we, we made. We're recommending the reason, the motion for the reasons that Mr. Bachman has stated. Um, the uh, question of going to a higher amount uh, in the base motion. We know that there are a lot of other costs that the town incurs, and we haven't had a chance to examine and quantify what those costs are. Uh, we know, um, for example, that um, there are inspections department um, requirements. There may be, um, at some future time, zoning enforcement questions as to whether it's appropriately zoned. Um, there could be public safety um, costs that are incurred, and um, it's a very small amount of money. Since we don't know any of this now, um, we thought that it, it's an issue to come back at a later date when we have more information. But uh, at this point, giving maximum flexibility to the budget process doesn't cut us off from making a decision at a later date to put more money in any single direction. Uh, and uh, Pat did bring up this topic at the uh, CRC meeting, and it was basically the same discussion there. And Stephen, anything further? Uh, uh, Andy, sp Andy spoke well for on behalf of CRC. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, then we have the first motion, which is to accept the provision of Mass General Law Chapter 64G, Section 3D, to impose a local option community impact fee at the rate of 3% effective July 1st, 2019, and apply to transfer of occupancy of professionally managed units. Uh, one or two or more short-term rental units in the same city town, operated by the same operator owner, and not located within a single or two or three family dwelling that includes the operator's primary residence. Do I hear a motion? Dorothy. I so move. Second. Okay, Kathy has seconded it. Uh, any further discussion on that one? All those in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Uh, the second motion is to accept the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 64G, uh, Section 3D, to impose a local option community impact fee at the rate of 3% effective July 1st, 2019, and applying to transfer of occupancy of short-term rental units located in the two or three family dwellings that includes the operator's primary residence. Do I hear a motion? I will move that. Dorothy. Second, Mandy Jo, any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Um, the third one is the th that 35% of the community impact fee collected under Mass General Law 64G, Section 3D be dedicated to affordable housing or local infrastructure projects, and the balance of the funds be a general fund revenue of the town of Amherst that may be appropriated for any municipal purpose. Do I hear a motion? Kathy is, has moved it, second? Second it. Dorothy is second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? And uh, that is one, two, please keep your hands up. Okay, one, 
Do you have them? Let me know when you're done, Margaret, okay? Opposed and abstain. So Pat opposed and Dorothy abstained. Darcy abstained. Darcy abstained. Oh my God. Uh, sorry. Uh, so the vote was 11 1 1. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, uh, which is appointments. And this is town council appointments. We're going to take the Zoning Board of Appeals first. And there are two presentations involved in this. The first one is to specifically talk about the process. And the second is to then talk about the actual appointments. So uh, Evan, I understand you're doing the process. Is that correct? OK, so we need the slides for um, 8A and B first set. Okay. okay. Uh, so I'm going to speak uh, hopefully briefly, although if members of the council have questions, I have no issue with them asking them as I'm talking. Uh, regarding the process that uh, outreach, appoint, uh, outreach communications appointments used uh, in order to bring to you tonight our recommendations for appointments to planning board and the zoning board of appeals. Uh, so Margaret, you could, are you controlling this machine? Okay, so this looks complicated. I'm gonna walk you through it. Uh, and so this is a process that OCA adopted uh, on 3-18-2019 after uh, more hours of deliberation uh, than I ever want to remember. And so to give you a little bit of the background to this process, uh, OCA set out to do two things. One was to maximize uh, transparency and two was to protect privacy. And balancing those turned out to be a very difficult process. Uh, we sought to make sure that uh, we had proper checks and balances in our process, but we also wanted to make sure that we didn't create any unnecessary barriers to entry um, by creating a process that could perhaps intimidate uh, applicants who are not used to town government. One of the goals of uh, our town government in the charter, one of the goals of I think many of us on this council, is to try to diversify our boards and committees, try to bring in genuinely new voices, people who have not participated in our town discussions in the past, and we recognize that those are the people who might be scared off um, by things like public interviews or, or the, the release of their names publicly. And so we've tried very hard to find a process that could balance transparency and concerns over privacy uh, in order to have a pool that was diverse. Uh, and this is what we came up with. It was a difficult one to do within the constraints of open meeting law, um, and so I'll walk you through a little bit of it. So applicants submit the community activity forms. Those are all then forwarded to the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Uh, we received all uh, CAFs for Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals on April 19th. Uh, the rule that we had adopted was in order for each member of OCA to see the CAFs, but to ensure that they did not become uh, public as they were being treated as personnel records as they have been historically in our town, uh, we could view them. We could read them. We could not discuss them with each other because once they were brought into consideration, they would have to be released. And so in order to treat them as the personnel records that they are, we could view but not deliberate on individual CAFs. OCA then elected a designee who would be charged with conducting all of our interviews. That designee was our chair, Sarah Swartz. Uh, and so if we're moving from the red box to the big interview box, uh, the OCA designee conducted all of the interviews. She could include at her discretion the town manager, the committee chair of either committee, and the staff liaison to those committee. It was not an interview committee, an interview team. Uh, they could be there if they were available. They might not be. It was completely at her discretion. Uh, the only mandatory participant was the OCA designee. Uh, the reason we had only one was that the moment we put a second counselor on, it became a subcommittee of our committee and therefore would have to abide by open meeting law and therefore every interview would have to be a posted public meeting. Uh, we felt that it would be inappropriate to do 
interviews as posted public meetings, and so we elected only a single individual to do those interviews. Those interviews took place on April, 21st, uh, April 25th and May 1st. Uh, the chair, or the OCA designee, then thought about these things really hard and came up with her recommended appointees. Those were released publicly on May 9th uh, on our meeting posting and then came to OCA on May 13th. At that time, OCA deliberated on them. We had a uh, very thorough discussion of all of the recommended appointees and along with a discussion of the process itself, uh, and we took a vote. Those recommended appointees have now been forwarded to the town council. You have in your packets our report, um, which is really two documents. One is the report from the OCA designee to OCA, which is the lengthier report that details the entire process, the profiles of the recommended appointees, and then a shorter cover page that details uh, the committee deliberation on May 13th, uh, along with some uh, future considerations that we saw having gone through this process about things we might want to uh, discuss in the future. And so now we are there at the town council. Um, and so at this point, the council has our recommended appointees. You have a report that details who they are, what the deliberation was around them, um, and it is up to you uh, to now decide whether or not to appoint them. I want to be clear about what your options are. Uh, option one would be that you could vote to appoint uh, the members of the, that, that were recommended by OCA. You could reject any individual member or all members, at which point they would be sent back to OCA and we would be tasked then with bringing you new folks. Uh, you could also refer back to us if you feel like you need more information. So uh, I think we gave you a 32 page report. So I think we gave you enough information. Um, but if you feel like you don't have enough information about the appointee, the recommended appointees, if you feel as though you don't have enough information about the applicant pool, um, if you feel like the applicant pool is insufficient, you can always refer these back to us and we can bring back to you at a later date. Margaret, if you want to go to the next slide. One of the documents that you have, and I am not going to read through this the way I just did, um, because I'm assuming that everyone looked at this already, we tried to come up with a decision tree that you all could use to think about what are, you, what are you considering with regard to these appointees and whether you want to uh, appoint or not? And so the first two questions there are about the appointees themselves. Do they have the required experience? Um, and then the, the bulk of it, the, the bottom part of that, so that decision tree, has to do more with questions about the applicant pool itself because we recognize that obviously the appointees are a product of the applicant pool. Um, and so discussion about whether to appoint needs to necessarily involve consideration uh, not just of the names we put forth, but also the names that were available to us. Uh, and so that is our process. I can field any questions. Otherwise, I think we'll hand it over to our chair slash OCA designee. Before you do that, I just want to go back to the slide before this and point out that at the time the recommended appointees and the memo was sent to OCA based on a vote of the council. All council people received all the CAFs for these two committees that were applicants for these two committees. Okay. Are there any questions at this time regarding the process? Dorothy. I'm not sure if, if this is the right time, but um, <clears throat> the process was made in, w under the guidance of how to do it within the open meeting law. And um, this past week, I went to an open meeting law meeting, um, which Alyssa went to also. And I believe we heard a different interpretation of the open meeting law than which this committee was given, um, which would allow the whole committee, if they went into executive session, to do a preliminary look at all of the resumes, all of the CAFs, and also for the whole committee to sit in on the interviews as long as they uh, recommended to the council twice the number of candidates for the positions. Um, I also want to strongly say that, um, I mean, I know that this committee worked very, very hard and that they worked to their very best trying to do the right thing for the candidates, for the council, and to do it in the open meeting law. But um, I'm going to, and I will recommend, I will support their choices at this moment. But I am recommending that the process be 
reconsidered after we get through this initial appointment so we can get our committees moving, and that we make a very clear policy on term limits um, that is going to be applied uniformly um, uh, with all candidates across all committees, and that we have a clear idea of how long one can be, if one has served their term, um, how long you have to wait before you can reapply, and that the CAFs be called public documents as they are in Northampton, which would make them able to be posted um, on the town website so that people could see it. Um, and I just want to add my personal note to this. Um, many times I did things in life only after I saw who was doing what, and I saw what, they, what their qualifications were, um, looked at what they did, and then I said, oh, I could do that. Um, so I think that we would get more applicants if this were more public. I know that the committee had to work very hard with the applicants they got, um, but that if we made it a public system, that we would have more applicants and we'd be bringing in new people as, if we, as we observe the term limits, constantly bringing in new blood. I'm sorry, are there additional comments? Can I, can I respond? Please. There's a lot there. Um, so there, there's two points I do want to respond to uh, in particular, though. One is uh, the question about open meeting law, or the statement made about open meeting law in executive session. Uh, we spoke extensively with our town attorney. We had uh, one meeting where I believe we spent two hours on speakerphone with our town attorney, another meeting where we spent a, a good chunk of time um, to run past the various options. I think we drafted four different processes that look like this mm -hmm. and ran them all through and um, for the most part uh, they were shot down by town attorney. Uh, the information we received regarding executive session, someone stop, uh, step in if I'm incorrect here, was that the full committee could not go into executive session, only a subcommittee so that you have two people going to executive session. The problem remained uh, one that uh, it wouldn't be the full committee, and so you'd still have this, this small amount. Um, but two, you're right that we would have, we would have had to bring forward uh, more Sorry. applicants than there were slots, and we felt like that still put people in an uncomfortable position where their name was brought forward publicly as a potential finalist um, and then publicly rejected, and we felt like that could make people uh, who are on the fence uncomfortable. Uh, with regard to your, your comments on the process, if you read our report, uh, we, do, we did extensively discuss what we labeled as future considerations, um, and this committee does have every intention of reviewing multiple aspects of the process going forward um, once we get through uh, the committees that we need to appoint by July 1. Are there further comments? Yes, Dorothy. Um, so the, the workshop I went to was run by the Attorney General's office, and it, it did sound as if it was some, the interpretation was different from what the town attorney had said. But I would say that um, a, another way to do this in public is to, to elect the offices then. Um, I see nothing wrong with having people's names out there. This is, you're dealing with power, extremely important decisions on the zoning and the uh, Board of uh, Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, I see nothing wrong with people's names being out there. It's a public process, and I think the public wants to know who applied and who was appointed. Kathy. Um, I have a, a question um, about the process. I believe you made a decision that when people came in to interview, for interviews, uh, you didn't suggest to them that if they had a short bio, a resume, a CV, you know, any blurb around them, about themselves they bring. And then the information that we were given as counselors for almost all was just a CAF, which in many cases people put a sentence in at most and didn't actually talk even about their experience within their field, you know, if they were or whatever, tell us what they've done. So there's extremely little information to go on if you weren't in the interview. And I'm just wondering what led you to a decision not to gather the additional information? Uh, and if it were available, I didn't want someone to have to write essays just for this, but you know, if they had anything they could come in with. Uh, that decision was based around uh, our hope to protect the privacy of applicants. Uh, CAFs are personnel records and can be uh, then shielded from disclosure. Uh, had, they, had we asked for uh, resumes, CVs, uh, those I do not believe would have been subject to the same. 
Yes, Sarah. So I, I very much appreciate that the rest of the council is really, really thinking about this. And if you read the cover letter that went with my report, these are all things that, that we talked about. I mean, we found when I came back with applicants, people were like, why is one person's profile three times bigger than another's? And, and really what I had to go on was what they filled out with CAF. So if you read that, that's one of the things we wondered about. Um, next time, do we want to um, send questions and ask for written answers? Mm -hmm. Similar to like League of Women's Voters things where we all had those questions ahead of time, you wrote them and then they were published. So these are all things that we're thinking of. And of course, back again to the CAFs, when we started this process, um, the CAFs were as they always were, which was that they were considered personnel files and there was no disclaimer on the bottom. Nobody had really thought about putting that disclaimer on the bottom. And our pool was people who had applied two years ago to the time that we started these. So there wasn't really any way to retroactively go back and say to everybody, can, you, can we sign a new form? But that's something that we, if you read our report, that is definitely something that we're looking at. I mean, we, we went through this process, we had our meeting, we saw where it worked and we saw where it fell apart. So those are all things that we're definitely going to take up. Other further comments? Mandy Jo. So I first want to acknowledge how much work you guys have done and the line you've been really walking to try and protect privacy but keep a transparent process. But um, in looking at it from afar as a counselor who needs to make a decision on who to appoint, not just who to approve from some other body, um, I've struggled with what exact type of conversation could be held at the committee level because I, I get we're trying to empower our committees to bring us recommendations, you know, we don't want to rehash it here, but not, but feeling like I'm not sure we have enough information. Um, I know there were interviews, but we didn't really get any information about what was said in the interviews, even of those that are being recommended for us to appoint. Um, I'm also unsure exactly whether in that discussion for whether to recommend and who to recommend and bring those recommendations to us as a council, the committee could actually truly discuss all the applicants. It sounds like there couldn't be an actual discussion about all the applicants in that meeting, which then makes it hard for me as someone who's trying to vote on this to understand whether the applicants that are being put forward as those recommended could truly have had a good conversation about are these the best ones and the best um, mix for the time at this time. So I've struggled with not necessarily who's been put forward, but has this process done what we as counselors need it to do? And so, you know, I, I'm not sure I have enough information, I'm, and, and I, I'm glad to hear you guys are going to go back and look at this, um, but that makes it hard for me today to come up with, it, am I ready to vote? Um, and also, I'd like to hear how that conversation in committee could take place and whether the committee members felt like that was an adequate conversation, however it occurred, to be able to flesh out this is whatever's come to us and might come to us in the future, we have a couple more coming, um, has been adequate. So, Alyssa. If you're ready, I'm gonna refer to an old process. So for 20 years, we've been doing it roughly like this. And we've been keeping them private. And the body that appointed, which was the select board when it wasn't the town manager directly, the select board did not know anything more than what was on the CAFs, and a select board member went off and interviewed people and made a recommendation, and the rest of the select board said, we saw all the CAFs, some of which have almost no information on them, some of which have a lot of information on them. We never discussed the group, and because they were personnel records, so therefore we couldn't talk about exactly what you're talking about, which I know are the kinds of things executive session screening committees talk about, because I've been part of those too. But associated with these kinds of appointments, it's absolutely true that you are only getting that much information. It's also the same amount of information the previous appointing authority got. I'm not saying that makes it adequate. I'm saying it's not less. 
than what it was before. And so that's why we've talked already in our report about we see a lot of different issues here, partly because not just the things that we had to deal with to make this work, but also because this is 2019. Mm -hmm. This is a different time. Maybe we need to be looking at, yeah, okay, we carried forward as much of the old process as we could because people were used to it. They'd put in their applications 18 months ago. But after this moment in time, I think that this committee is extremely dedicated to, and you can certainly ask us to report back, and we certainly have every intention of doing so once we get through this round of interviews for this and the other bodies that are supposed to be appointed by the town council by July 1st, to have those conversations and to come back to you and say, it's looking like this. What do you think if we try doing this? What if we went to a completely open process? What would be the shortcomings of that? What is a way that, in fact, the counselors who aren't in the interview, because the other counselors at, that are on OCA know no more than you do about any of those applicants. The only person who knows anything about those applicants that isn't on the CAF is the one person who's bringing them forward. While that's always been true, I understand that may no longer be satisfactory to people, but that is the same. So moving forward, what could we do? Executive session is one option, but again, it requires more than twice as many, it requires twice as many applicants as slots, and we have committees that we didn't even get twice as many applicants as slots. I, I want so to that's correct, a future conversation. I want to correct one impression. The CAFs that were considered were ones that we received as long ago as two years ago up to the present. Thank you. Steve. So I've said this before uh, at these meetings, but I think the charter anticipated sort of a, what I call the Goldilocks solution. So on one hand, you had the old process, which is the voters elect the select board who appoints the town manager, who appointed the planning board and zoning board of appeals. So the meetings I went to regarding this, a lot of people thought that that was too far from the voters. The other, the other end was our neighbors who directly elect the planning board and the zoning board of appeals. And a lot of people thought that would make the, it too political. So we don't, these are permitting bodies. We don't, in Massachusetts, we don't elect judges. So that's too, that's too direct. The compromise was, in my mind, the voters elect the town council who select the um, planning board and the zoning board of appeals. So now the voters are only two steps removed from the appointment. So what we've gotten, and this is nothing, this is not a critique, this is a critique on where we are, and it's different than this chart, but where we've gotten is the voters elect the town council who elect a president, who appoints a committee, OCA, the committee elects a chair, the chair nominates the interviews. So now we're, you know, we've honestly, we've created a incredibly convoluted yeah. system. We don't have any better information. In fact, we probably have worse information than, and this is no, um, we probably have, so we're really completely flying blind. And so we're either relying on personal knowledge of some of the people in both of the pools, or I don't know what we're relying on, but I definitely am not comfortable voting on something where we have such incomplete information. Also, uh, there are a lot of reappointments on the table. So there's really a ORCA, you know, outreach reappointment, <laughs> the killer whale. So, <laughs> so, um, so we have no idea why some people are being reappointed and others aren't. Did they get unfavorable reviews? Did they, you know, did they not fit a profile? So in other words, this really, really puts us in a really, really hard place, I think. So maybe I should tell you what I actually did as interview designee, which might answer some of your questions. And at the same time, um, no one is more painfully aware of the drawbacks of this than is your interview designee. Although I will tell you that I feel that I gave you, besides some personal comments people made, which I don't feel it was my job as an, an interviewer to bring to you, I gave you an incredible amount of information. So let me just tell you how I did it, and then we can go from there. And so one of the things that I will say is that um, as designee, I had to know what I was looking for before I even began an interview, which started with asking OCA themselves, what did we think were qualities that a person on these boards or committees, what should they possess? Which is what I wrote in my report to you, although I could repeat that if you wanted. 
Also, we contacted the chairs of both of these committees and said to them, what are the qualities and qualifications that you would be looking for, including what are the qualities and special qualifications that you're looking for that would actually strengthen your group? So those were things that I was looking for going into interviews. I also had the, what we would call the yes or no chart, which you have been provided. And also what I took into consideration, what I, I felt was, um, and I think we talked about this a little bit, that Andy kind of touched on it, was how are you then looking at the, the health of the entire border committee? What makes a healthy border committee? Which, granted, I did come up with on my own, and you also have been provided with. So armed with those things, um, I went into interviews. The, the people who were interviewed were given a packet ahead of time, which gave them um, the interview questions ahead of time, which gave them uh, an information sheet about the border committee, including um, what the time commitment was, what the board actually does, um, and uh, meeting times. Lots of information they would have about and, and the website. When I went into interviews, I very deeply was thinking about what every single person had said to me what they were looking for. When I went in, set the tone, everybody was told at the very beginning that um, the staff liaison was, was there, that, that Paul, our town manager, was there, but that I, as the OCA designee, was the one who was asking the questions, although my, my lovely counterparts could answer questions. Um, so, I did these interviews, I did take my own notes, um, I went back and I made spreadsheets, I made a Venn diagram with a paper and a really large glass, um, and I really thought about balancing all of these things, and I also thought about Mandy Jo sitting here and saying, how would I know, you know, like, what is the information that I have? Um, my computer had a, my computer had a hiccup, and I sat down and I pulled my first all-nighter since college, and I wrote down as much information as I possibly thought that I could give you without telling you some things that had happened that, granted, I felt were, were personal and were also about applic like applicants that I was not bringing forward. So yes, it was very, very difficult for me. Um, I, I filled everything out. I really balanced it. I really thought about what I felt fit into what everybody wanted and would also give you great applicants and would also balance out the board. Um, I can answer any questions that you have later about why I picked who I picked. Um, but I think if you look, you have an incredible amount of information about what I did, why I did it, and um, the pool that I had to choose from. Now I feel like I've just rambled on and on. But um, so when I brought names forward, one of the things that we had talked about was that we would not bring up the names of people who were not on the list, which um, now I'm finding that that's, that caused a lot of frustration. Um, and I understand people, I, I think what I understand about people in general is that I can give you almost all of the information that I possibly can give you. But I'm thinking that given um, the inquisitiveness of the public and of this council, that I could give you pretty much almost everything. But unless every single one of you is sitting in an interview, I'm not 100% sure that I could give you enough. And I think it's the same issue with the CAFs where I'm not sure if you sitting in those interviews with me would have changed your mind or not, um, if that actually would have given you more information, but I realize that people are really deeply feeling that they, have, they, they need to satisfy more of their, their own questions. I need to make a note that Amherst Media is recording. They have both the video and the audio, but is not being projected on Channel 17. Correct? Thank you. Sorry. Yes, Andy. So I'm going to touch on another subject, which is, I think, the reason that I'm not comfortable making it, uh, taking a vote tonight and would um, support a third of the motions that was uh, mentioned. Um, 
Sarah mentioned uh, that I had talked about um, being aware of the health of a body as we go through an appointment process. And she touched on it in her uh, May 8 memo to um, the OCA com committee um, at the top of uh, page six. And it says a healthy multi-member body so have a robust uh, number of members who have served over a year. And I guess that for a body like um, the planning board or the ZBA or many other bodies, um, the question of a year um, is not the only uh, qualification for what um, is a composite of members makes for a strong multi-member body. Um, because there needs to be some group that brings institutional knowledge and history with it and really understands what the border committee did over a long period of time, what the legal basis was, and the reasons for having taken the action that it did. When I looked at the planning board and I looked back at who were members uh, in January of 2017 uh, in 2018, but going back to 2017, we had a number of very um, senior people who have turned over from that committee. At this point, we only have one member who has been appointed before uh, 2015 who would be on the committee if we um, take the recommendations of um, OCA um, without giving it further consideration. Um, for those of us who were on the CRC, the Community Resources Committee, and attended a meeting that we had a joint meeting with um, the Planning Board's um, uh, zoning subcommittee, um, we, the, um, my observation was is that that one experienced member was able to provide a lot deeper information and a lot of history that was just otherwise not have been available to us during that presentation. And um, so in bringing this up, it is not a reflection on, the, on our committee and it is not a reflection on the people who are being recommended. It is um, sort of a request that a little bit more thought be given into the entire pool in making sure that um, the value of at least a member, if not a couple of members who can bring that kind of institutional history to the process without having all of the institutional history belonging to staff um, becomes um, something that is considered in this discussion. Evan. So one of, one of the things I want to first say is a lot of people are prefacing their statements with, we know you guys did a lot of work and this isn't against you. And uh, I, for one, am not taking any uh, <laughs> critiques personally, uh, despite being one of the people who uh, I think very strongly championed this process uh, that we now recognize as a lot of uh, flaws. Um, what, but one of the things I wanted to say is that uh, I think this is a really good discussion that we're having. Um, one of the things that we said to you a while back when there was a discussion about whether or not uh, you all wanted to vote on our process was we said, let's bring forth recommendations. Let's run the process out. Let's bring forth recommendations because we don't know how it's going to work until we run it. And then we ran it, and even the members of the committee will be the first to tell you we recognized a lot of deficiencies in the process that we didn't necessarily, some of which we anticipated, some of which we, we didn't. And so um, our, our, our comment to you has always been, let's run the process, let's bring forth recommended appointees, um, and then if you feel as though you are uncomfortable with the process, uh, that would be a time for you to look at the whole picture, what the process produced, what the process was, and make a decision about whether you wanted to move forward. Uh, it is May 20th. These recommendations, uh, in theory, should be done by 
June 30th. We have two meetings between now and then, right? And that was intentional. We intentionally brought these to you on May 20th and not June 17th because we wanted to make sure that if we brought forth recommendations that you had um, some, some questions about, if you had uh, concerns about the process, it gave us a full month to, to continue those discussions. And so um, I want to just sort of put that out there that the timing of this was very particular because we expected this debate to happen and I think it's good. And so I'd love to hear from everyone um, about their thoughts generally. Shalini, you had your hand up. So, okay. I'm just gonna keep it at this one question. Do I have a broader question? The, the more direct question is, why were there no recommendations for associates for the planning board? I'm sorry, repeat the question, please. Yeah, why were there no recommendations for associates in the, for the planning board? Okay. Because we haven't had associates for the planning board for over 20 years. And the fact that our bylaw says that we can have them didn't mean that we had to make them. And as I said, we have not appointed them for over 20 years. And as far as we know, we don't have a complete legal picture of what they would be allowed to do under the law. Okay, then I, can I, just, then I, I would like to hop on to the broader question. Because when I was looking at um, all the, can, the CAFs and I made a huge matrix as well, <laughs> sorry to repeat the work you all did. Um, but what I was looking at is how do we make this stronger, which of course what you were doing also. Uh, and what I felt was that looking at what was in the different experiences and um, of the different candidates, which was compelling and it's amazing and I'm so you know excited that we have such great expertise coming in, but it felt that we could make the current pool the way it is right now, the planning board, and we could make that, strengthen that and make it stronger if we, for the time being, while we're in transition, we continue with some of the people who are there and who have the expertise, and then bring on two more people who uh, would then be the associates and can be, uh, you know, sort of uh, there for a year and then be, and because what, in talking to some of the people, what I've heard is that it takes at least a year in the planning board to understand things, and we don't want to lose some important expertise during this transition time. So it would be great to strengthen it by keeping what we have and adding two more associates to that. Steve. So I too have been pondering the associate question. So we on the planning board know that it's in the zoning bylaw that two associates can be appointed to the planning board. So the fact that we haven't done that doesn't mean that we can't do it now. The charter specifically also allows for associates. So as far as I can tell, this is completely me speaking without, um, is that associate members are defined in two different places. One is in Mass General Law, and Mass General Law specifies that cities and towns can appoint associates to the Zoning Board of Appeals and to the Planning Board, uh, but only to act on special permits and only if someone's uh, a full member is absent. But the, there's, it's silent on whether or not you can expand that. So I, have, I did look at other communities, such as Cambridge, which allows full voting rights for associate members of their planning board, except for the one part where it's restricted on, where it's restricted by master law voting on special permits that has to be, follow that, but then they've expanded it to everything else. We're in the middle of a rules discussion. I think that this should be part of a, you know, a rules discussion, but to me that seems like a really good way of handling this transition. Kathy? I just want to speak uh, to, because I am new to this process, um, you know, the planning board in particular, but I looked at the recommended names and who is currently on the board, and we have six returning people. Three are already on, and three who are coming on will be serving second three-year terms often, or two-year. So I'm looking at a group that has anywhere from three to four years experience already and within a year will be five. So I don't think we're bringing in a brand new group. In fact, there's only one person that hasn't been on the board before. I was impressed by the ability to 
juggle this because our guidelines in the appointment handbook say if there's someone who's been serving a first term, give them a second term unless they really don't want it. If there's someone that's been there for two full terms, if there's a qualified group behind them, bring someone new in. And that's a general guideline on, so on institutional knowledge, I totally value. Um, but in my own experience, if you are willing to work really hard and absorb like a sponge, um, and as a youngster, I was thrown in to national health policy and asked to redesign Medicaid. Uh, and they said, come back in three months, and boy, did I know Medicaid in three months. You know, it wasn't impossible. It was, you know, up against a wall, but you can learn really fast if you need to. So the balance of bringing only one person in with a bunch of people who, six that, with these appointments, will be building up even more expertise. We're not starting new here. We've, we've got a skilled experienced group that are quite varied. That's the other thing that's, they're not all architects or not all lawyers or not all engineers. You know, I can imagine some other ways we might enrich it in the future, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting mix of what they've done in their life in addition to serving. So I, I think this does have experience. I just want to erase the idea that we don't have any institutional knowledge here. Are there other comments? Sarah. So when I was looking at when I was looking at this whole board, I took into consideration a lot of different things. Um, again, as Kathy said, I had seen a chair that had been there for two terms, and I also took a look at the fact that I was only changing one person, bringing one new person along, and to me, it added a fresh face, and I also chose a person that I think by looking at their personal qualifications showed that they were a quick study. So um, I, I don't think that we're looking at a, a dearth of experience. Um, <laughs> so, so, and we've never, we've, we haven't had associates in 20 years. This is really, I know it's in there, but this is news to me, and no one asked me to look for it. And it, to me, it seems also, from what I understand, an associate would not only had, have no vote, would only be brought in in very, very rare occasions. So there really isn't much of a chance for that person to be brought along. So I think that we should sort of think about that. I, I mean, per, per mass law as well. Are there other comments? Darcy. Um, <clears throat> I also know the, the charter doesn't speak about associate members. So um, I think it would, uh, it might be problematic if the charter doesn't allow for associate members. Uh, they're not mentioned in the charter. The charter is silent on the issue. If it's yes. silent on an issue, then it is not illegal. It is in our zoning bylaw. It's in the zoning bylaw. Yes. And it's also in the charge of the committee for both from, that we got from Doug Slaughter uh, when with a huge packet of committee charges in there. If you go to the planning board, you see that there are also associates allowed. Yeah. I, uh, I'm just saying, that I, yes. I, clarifying what's allowed or not allowed. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, that I found uh, Sarah's report um, really well-reasoned. I think she did a really fantastic job, um, the amount of work that she put in. She, um, her reasoning was very fair. She looked uh, not only at people's qualifications, but she really looked a lot at whether there was still going to be a base of institutional knowledge left on the board. Um, she looked also at whether or not there would be a balance of opinion, uh, a diversity of opinion. And that's um, you know, one thing that, of course, I think a lot of us saw during our campaigns, 
that there, there is a difference of opinion out there in our community. There, there is, um, you know, a variety of views about how the planning board should do its work. And um, I, you know, I recently visited my, uh, my sister and brother-in-law. He's on uh, the select board in Suffield, Connecticut, and I asked him how they appoint committees. Um, and of course he said, well, we, we just have certain slots for the Democrats and certain slots for the Republicans, and they fill them. Um, so I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I just feel like uh, we need to have more of a balance on the planning board for to represent the views that we have in town of all of our residents. We, we saw that during the campaign, like I said, that there are a lot of people who feel like there should be some change. And um, Sarah could have come to back to us with a totally uh, new slate of members of the planning board with four new members uh, so that, you know, there would be a total change in the balance on the planning board. But she didn't do that. She it just is proposing like a very, very modest change to the planning board. One member change. Um, and that member presumably would uh, help to add to the balance of the planning board so that we would be a democratic body. We would be more representative of the people in Amherst and their views. So I'm hoping that this body will think about that and take into consideration that we, we don't want to be a body that's just appointing people that have one point of view. We want to be democratic. I'm going to um, ask that we pause for a moment and just summarize. We have three different conversations going on, okay? Uh, one of them is the process itself. The second is the uh, appointees uh, that are before us tonight or recommended appointees before us tonight for the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the third is the recommended appointees before us tonight for the Planning Board. And we will take those up individually. We are not voting on the process, but we've had several comments on that. We, this is an item that does in fact include public comment, and so I'd like to see a show of hands for those people who plan to make public comment. Okay, when you come forward, please Say your name, where you live, and keep your comments to no more than three minutes. Mr. Greeny. I signed the paper there. Yes, you also need to sign in. I did sign in. You did sign in. Thank you very much. Wow, you guys are really working. <laughs> I think it's, it's good to sit here. I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and see how hard you're working. I appreciate it. Um, you really have something to work out in the process. I don't even want to touch that hornet's nest. But I do want to say that I favor as open as possible a process. What makes the quality of our community is the people. The buildings are important, but the people are more important. And you want people in Amherst to feel included in their government. Please, you know that. So participation and inclusion are essential. So just keep that in mind. I represent a demographic that feels either unrepresented or not represented at all. And I think a lot of people feel the way I do. So there's privacy and transparency. You know that the, the word of privacy is going to imply some negative things. <laughs> and 
if I'm going to accept that this urgent issue of privacy is necessary, I want to know how many people applied that wouldn't have applied because of the privacy issue. How many applicants are we getting? So if you really want to go with this issue of privacy, you need to have that information, because I have to say I don't imagine that there's a lot of people that aren't applying because of privacy. Also, I'm at another extreme. I truly, absurdly, was expecting that there were going to be three new appointees out of four people. <laughs> and that the idea of institutional memory is important, but fresh new perspectives and creative ideas are what the planning board needs. That's my own opinion. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The gentleman with the hat on. <laughs> Good evening, Art Keene, District 5. I'd like to offer three comments for your consideration as you move forward in evaluating your appointment process, as well as for the decisions that you're going to undertake tonight. First, a plea for support of term limits and diversity. I believe that term limits are a necessary component of good government, and I urge that they be officially adopted and maintained for committee appointments, and I urge enforcing them with equity and consistency. I understand the comfort that can be found in simply reappointing the same people. Reappointees already know the ga how the game is played. They already know each other. They've worked out the complexities of working together. They require no orientation and can reliably predict how others will behave, speak, and vote. Without term limits, those currently sitting on a committee will inevitably appear more qualified than those who are new. A healthy multi-member body is one where no single person is indispensable. Without consistently bringing in new people, a body can grow stale and it can easily become an echo chamber. Bringing new folks in at regular intervals can bring in new ideas, new perspectives, new energy, and provide a framework for training new and sustainable leadership. Failure to do so discourages public participation. A diverse body that includes those who have been traditionally left out will strike the public as, that includes those who have been traditionally left out, will strike the public as more open, more democratic, and more trustworthy than the same lineup year in, year out. The one new person nominated to the planning board would join members with combined experience, if I've added this up correctly, of 18 years on the planning board, adding a tiny bit of new to a lot of continuity. My second point is transparency, and you've already dealt with a lot of this. The existing confidentiality requirement has handcuffed OCA in its deliberations about the candidates, and several of you have already commented on this. It has constrained OCA, and indeed the full council, from comparing details of those candidates who were nominated with those candidates who were not. While some members of OCA have taken a public stance against the one new nominee to the planning board, judging her as unacceptable, we are left without a process for sorting out what this means. If some counselors find a candidate acceptable and others do not, how is this to be sorted out in a way that illuminates the factual basis for these different judgments while ensuring that the candidate is still treated fairly? Without a public airing of candidates' qualifications, all we're left with is hearsay and innuendo. And so, okay, finally, just a word of, in support of Janet, since people voted against her. Um, in establishing a list of desirable characteristics of board members, there was a lot of talk about the need to appoint people who can work well with others. And I want to say, from my own experience, that there's no need to fear Janet McGowan's appointment in this regard. During her time in sound meeting, town meeting, I saw Janet work time and again with some of the most challenging personalities in the organization, getting them to work well with others and together to get stuff done. This is what she does for a living. She's a professional mediator, and I suggest that any board or committee that she joins will only become more effective as a result of her presence. Thank, Thank you, you for much. your comments, Art. Yes.
Maura Keen, um, also from District 5. And I just want to say I've been sitting through the last four or five of these meetings watching the council tie itself into knots over this process. Obviously, there's something wrong with the process. You talk about balancing transparency and privacy, but I don't see any transparency in this process. And new people aren't comfortable with the amount of transparency there is either. So I do think this process is mightily flawed. I think relying on one person, no matter how conscientious Sarah is, or to make all the decisions for everybody else is wrong for the council, is wrong for the town. And I hope that there will be a more open process in the future. Thank you for your comments. Additional comments? Yes, come forward, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, Jack Jumsek, um, District 5. Um, I'm on the planning board now. Uh, and I'm just wondering if the email that uh, we sent was uh, in everybody's hands uh, with regard to our comments. OK. Well, so I just want to say, uh, what my concern is, I, I, this is not about uh, individuals. Janet McGowan is certainly qualified. That's, that's not my concern. But in losing Greg Stutzman, I'm, I'm very concerned that we're losing the most senior person on the planning board. Um, we already lost a couple of people that had 10 years plus experience, Steve Schreiber being one, Rob Crowner. Uh, the planning board requires uh, quite a bit of uh, work to get up to speed and, and understand and be able to critique the projects that come before us. Um, so from my perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned that we'll be losing uh, our current chairman, who has only been chairman for six months. But he's got six years, six strong years. I've been on for two and a half years. Um, and I'm learning, and there is this, this learning curve. I mean, you talk to every person on the planning board, it takes a lot of time to understand the technical nature of the bylaws that, that, that we're reviewing, and you know, each project. Uh, we, we thank God that the Amherst Planning Department are very well qualified. So Chris Brestrup really, uh, and, and her uh, department really helps us do our job. So, that's a concern of mine. And then just on top of that, we shrunk from nine to seven. I know that's not a big deal, but we, we, we have less people now than we did before. Um, and I'm just, and I think uh, Ms. Schoen, yeah, I like, the thing with the term limits, you know, that's, that's a separate issue, but sometimes it's important, you know, that I think the, the term more than you know, the two terms be considered uh, in, the, in the situation because getting qualified people is not the most easy thing. I, I came uh, and I, uh, I was asked to be on the planning board. I think I was interviewing for another committee position. There, there, there are a lot of people that are interested in what happens in town, but uh, you, know, you, want, you want good people, you want qualified people. And, and, and I tell you the truth, I never even, I never think about, you know, Democratic or Republican aspects of zoning. I mean, we're looking at technical aspects of a building, and there's nothing political about anything that, any decision that we make. It's, does it comply uh, with the zoning bylaw? And if there's a waiver, is it reasonable or not? And we try to, you know, protect the town. We try to... Uh, personally, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I, I like seeing our tax base increase <laughs> in the downtown area, which was, you know, part of a, uh, one of the only areas that we can kind of densify. Um, and I'm, I have my email here. I'm just, I'm just looking. I didn't plan on coming uh, up here, but, um, so, and, and, and there was a talk of the associate position. I would also uh, suggest that there's a possibility for our 
a zoning subcommittee as a uh, as a, like a spawning ground for people. But right now we only have three positions uh, that are filled by existing planning board uh, members, and the zoning subcommittee could grow with additional members. So there's I don't think, and th you know what a great area for someone to get a leg up on on what future uh, tasks would be required of a, a planning board member. So I just wanted to put that out there as an alternative to you know, an associate uh, 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 position in terms of getting, uh, having additional people that would be ready to go or be, be better prepared to go on uh, you know, day one of a, of a new appointment. And then all this comes, to, you know, why is experience important? Right now, we, I feel like we've been, uh, we've been waiting for the charter to, to come along. We've been waiting for the council to come along and be appointed. And, and right now, I didn't realize how easy our job has been. And now it's about to get really hard. <laughs> and, you know, we're, and we're nervous about that. We got the master plan, and we and we have the zoning issues. That again, everything has been, you know, in, in a little bit of a hiatus. So that's where this experience thing comes, you know, and, and uh, that much more important, I think, uh, to me personally, anyway. So. Thank, thank you, you for your comments. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at this time? Yes, Christine. Hi, Christine Gray Mullen, I'm on the planning board. Um, I, everything that Jack said, I agree with, and I just wanna add that I really feel it takes at least two years to come up to speed on the basics and move from being a beginner to an intermediate. So really what we have right now is one senior member who is an intermediate. Standard practice in Massachusetts, according to Mass General Law, it suggests three to five year terms with no term limits. And Amherst has gone the conservative route and gone with three years. But what happens if you stick with the two term, or you never get anyone past six years, which is not the norm. If you have two terms with five years, then people have 10 years of experience. So what happens is you get a few players that have, because people do move on and leave and you know life happens. But it, it's critical to have a couple of those senior, really experienced members who remember. And what's happened is we had a bunch of these, and we've lost three or four of them over the last couple of years. So what we're, we're remaining with is one senior member who is an intermediate member, and we really count on him, is the chair. Because the chair is a very important leader for the group. And if he leaves, we're left with all six with less than four years. I myself are one of the two people who are three and a half years in, and I am vice chair right now, and I don't know if I would be, but if I was chair, I feel like we're a really green group. And like what's been brought up, there's a master plan that's very complex that will have to be worked on in the next few years, along with uh, new zoning. And I think our concerns came up before we even knew, I mean, we still don't know who the applicants are, and even before the memo of recommendations came out, that had nothing to do with why we're concerned. So please consider that. Um, I personally would really like to see our senior members still on there for another three years and, and get up to nine years, and then a few of us up to six. And, and really to loosen any concept of two terms because I think there should always be an open door to having a couple of members who remember and know and can help the junior members. Um, and just the last thing, a little point of fact, you know, there's a lot of this like turnover, we need new. Um, just to remind everyone, the two buildings of concern that were so much brought up last year, it's 1EP and Kendrick Place. Six of the seven members were not even on the board when those buildings came. So six of us never had any, any more than you did on input on those buildings. And so please keep that in mind. We already are mostly a new group. And as Jack was saying, oh, you know, I didn't realize we've had it easy lately. Well, because there has been a lot of limbo and waiting, 
but we're finally coming up to a time, and you all know this. You're six months in. I mean, do you feel like in another six months you'll be ready to really know everything and take the wheel? I, yeah. So please, feel your own and think of us. And we're asking you, we want what's best for Amherst. We want quality projects, and we want quality rezoning and a wonderful master plan. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay, we're going to return to the council. Let me just suggest that we move off the process knowing full well that we all feel we need to take a hard look at this process and that other issues that have been brought up to which the council does not have a policy and that is the issue of term limits, okay? Uh, so those are two things for a future discussion. Um, the issue of associates is in part there and part not because we do have associates that are being nominated for the ZBA and the opportunity does exist, though they have not been nominated at this time for the planning board. So is there any other conversation about that before we move to the discussion of the actual slate of nominees? Yes, Re Evan. So I think the real question before we move on off of the process is for the members of the council who do not serve on OCA, do you feel as though you have sufficient information based on our process to make a decision this evening? Because I think that was going to, to some extent, inform the next discussion that we have. That's a reasonable question to ask. Some people have already spoken to it. Are there any other comments on it? I just have Kathy. a question. Um, can we decide to have a larger planning board than seven? I mean, do we have, can we make that decision? It is, according to the charter, it is seven people. So it can only be seven. It can only be seven according to the charter. So it can have associates because the charter is silent on the issue of associates. Okay, the, and, and then just The actual this. charge that is presently under which the planning board operates allows for, I believe, two associates. Yes, Aunt Mandy Jo. I, I'd like to actually clarify that. Um, the transition article in the charter set as of the date the charter passed the planning board to seven members and the ZBA to five members until such time as some other number might or could at some point maybe be adopted. And I put all of that in there. Um, it's in the transition article. I'm, if you give me time, I can probably find the wording. Um, let me find it. Um, but it, the Charter Commission recognized that it currently the, the MGL allows for various sizes of both of these boards and that Amherst prior to adoption of this charter had set those sizes by charge, um, not per the Town Government Act. Um, and therefore they worked, the Charter Commission worked very hard to reset the size based on comments the Charter Commission had heard from the public and from the board. For ZPA, we didn't follow the board's comments, we followed the public's comments. For Planning Board, we heard a lot about, about reducing the size, but wanted to not put it in a portion of the charter where you would need to amend the charter if a size did not work out. Um, so in theory, um, it is 10.7n, page 33 of the charter, the status of the planning board shall be as follows, shall be seven members as of December 3rd, 2018, and shall remain such size until and unless the town council adopts a measure increasing or decreasing the size. Um, as a former charter commissioner, I would urge this council to give seven a chance before it even considers modifying that number. Um, the charter commission talked 
long and hard about what to do with that, given all of the comments we had heard about both planning and ZBA. And so my position would be because, just because we have a difficult vote coming up, we shouldn't go and try and change the number immediately. We should see how it works. But the charter does not prohibit the size from changing. Thank you. Steve. Yeah, so I completely agree that this is not the time to you know, raise it back up to nine because we, we have a hard decision in front of us. But it definitely is a time for us to consider the role of associate members. So, you know, again, um, Mass General Law specifies what it can do, but it doesn't specify. It's restrictive that it only comments on special permit, but then it's silent on what other things the person can do. And so what we learned in the zoning um, sessions that we had with the planning staff is that things like site plan review are a construct of the town. They're not governed by mass general law. And we also learned that their quirks in the zoning bylaw where absolute numbers are stated rather than, than percentages. Like rather than say majority, it might say there must be a super majority or at least five. So associate members in that case play a really key role in making sure that there's enough people at the, you know, at the table to actually vote on site plan reviews and special permits while we consider rules changes. So I, I'm urging us to consider associate members as sort of a compromise solution between some very difficult decisions that we're, we're facing. Michelle. So what we're all hearing, and I think we can all agree, is that we want participation. We want uh, residents um, enthusiasm to be, you know, we don't want to curb that. And we are so lucky that we have a really existing good group of planning board people who are willing to put in extra years into it. And we have very good residents who want to join the committee. So if we step back and see what would make our existing planning board stronger, would it be doing what is right now proposed or would it be taking what we have and adding two associates, what would make our planning board stronger? And I would urge us to really think about that as an outcome, like our goal is to, to do stuff that's better for Amherst. And this is obviously in recognition of all the work that's been put in, but again, we are a work in progress, so I'm hoping we'll keep an open mind. Alyssa. I think it's important to recognize that under the privacy laws that we have been we have imposed upon ourselves here we don't know as a council which people filed CAFs who later withdrew CAFs who later expressed disinterest in the body it is not reasonable for any of us to assume based on the existence of a CAF whether or not a particular person who put in a CAF is in fact willing to continue to serve that's not a public statement that's not a public document so I believe I heard you just say someone's still willing to serve, but we don't know that as a body because we don't know if any of the people who originally put CAFs are continuing in the process. So that's one point. The other, and I know that makes this is that really complicated pretzel part of this, because if you wanted to do that, which I'm saying right now, I'm confident the future process won't look like this, but <laughs> if it was, even if you were trying to like nibble around the edges, so you get your first CAF pool, then somebody moves, so then you tell everybody on the council, somebody moved, then you tell somebody on the council, ah, they didn't really want to interview, you tell the council that. Then you tell the council, uh, their interview, they decide to pull out after their interview. You're not getting any of those updates at um. this point, and so that's part of it. The other issue with the associates is I'm unbelievably object to the idea of on the fly after 20 years of not including associates to think we can decide ourselves at a town council meeting based on what you know about MGL and what I know about MGL, just go ahead and do associate members. <laughs> so let's not do that. But I'm totally open to the fact that our zoning bylaw, right, because I'm also on bylaw review, and that the measure that Mandy Joe's speaking of is not just we say here we want nine. The measure is to change the zoning bylaw. 
to say how many we have, because the zoning bylaw says how many, count, how many members we have right now. So that is a fact. And so it, it is. I mean, it, it, that's a fact. So that's the measure that's being referred to as a bylaw change. It doesn't mean we can't change the bylaw, and that's fine. But to make up an associate as a, I'm sorry, I'm very frustrated. To make up an associate concept on the fly when we, in fact, don't have a complete legal definition in front of us feels very uncomfortable to me. I am totally willing to consider that soon. I just don't want it to muck up what we're doing right now. I'm going to, Pat, since we have not heard from you, I'm recognizing you. I don't always recognize myself. Um, one of the things that I do know, uh, and everyone in this room probably knows, is that change is difficult. Um, I feel strongly that um, we need to think not now about associates, not now about nine members, but um, Mr. Stuntsman is the person who is leaving the committee. If, if we vote for the, uh, this, these recommendations, which I am planning to do, is to vote for Oka's recommendations. My feeling is, knowing him after only watching him work at one meeting, why can't he be invited to be an advisor, a non-voting member, not an associate, but an advisor to the committee? Um, I think, given who he is, that might be something that he'd be willing to do, and that's an assumption on my part. I do not know the man enough to say that because that way we can save institutional memory and experience um, and we can also honor the work of OCA and the recommendations that are being made. I'm going to ask that we move on to the votes. Um, okay. Let's see where we get to. Okay. We're moving on to the slide that shows the ZBA. Okay. This is the appointment recommendations of the ZBA for the ZBA that Oga has put before us. Do I hear a motion? Evan. So I'm going to read the motion that's on the sheet, I assume, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I move to appoint the Zoning Board of Appeals under the Amherst Home Rule Charter, Section 2.9C, for terms commencing July 1st, 2019, Mark Parent, whose terms shall expire on June 30th, 2020, Thomas Simpson and Matthew Wilk, whose terms shall expire on June 30th, 2021, Steve Judge and Joan O'Mara, whose terms shall expire on June 30th, 2022, and associate members Aaron Arcello, Sharon Waldman, and Tammy Parks, whose terms shall expire on June 30th, 2020, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Is there a second? I'll second. Mandy Joe seconded that. Further discussion? I have a question. Uh, the associates all have a very short term. Um, I, could you explain the reason? Is there history on that one, Alyssa? That's how associates work. They're one-year terms. It's just, in, in it's just for ZBA, they've always been one-year terms. Okay. Thank you. That's my observation. They often get reappointed. Yeah. yeah. Can, can I just ask my other question? Could they be more terms, or is it just we've always done it that way? Could they be two years? We would have to change the bylaw, and we're not going to okay, deal so with that tonight. It's written into Thank the you. bylaw. Okay. I don't know. We have to explore that and look at it another time. For now, this is the motion before you. It's been made and seconded. Are there further questions? Okay. All those in favor of this set of appointees for the Zoning Board of Appeals, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Okay. We're moving on to the um, next one, which is the Planning Board. It's the next slide. 
And do I hear a motion? Andy. We're going to move to refer the planning board appointments back to the OCA committee. Is there a second? Okay. Would you like to speak to your motion, Andy? I think that there have been a number of very important um, questions raised today about both the process, the composition of the committee, the input we received from a couple members of the planning board, and my own observations that I had previously stated about experience and what is the definition of experience. And uh, I think that they merit a little bit more consideration. Um, and I think that the best place for that to happen is in the committee. Are there further comments regarding this motion? Yes, Steve. So here's my concern, is that I think that all the public comment was regarding basically um, one particular slot on the planning board that's currently held by the chair. Um, numbers one, three, and four did not elicit any discussion at all. And I'm wondering if it's possible if the maker of the motion would consider simply to possi I, I, I'm way beyond my Robert's Rules of Order, but if it is possible that we can at least dispose of the ones that seem to be non-controversial. That would take an amendment. Okay, so then I move to amend the motion to refer number two back to OCA, but to approve as recommended numbers one to three and four. Is there a second? <laughs> yes. It it, does Robert, does any type of amendment rule allow a motion I, to refer to also a include a question. I was about approval? ready to look at Margaret and say, Margaret, what do I do here? <laughs> would, would you like a recess? I think so. Yeah. Let's uh, have a recess. Now's your bathroom break, and we'll figure out where we are. Thank you. Okay, just to recap, we started with a motion to refer the entire planning board recommendation, recommended appointees back to OCA. That was made and seconded. We now have a motion on the floor that has not been seconded to refer back to OCA the recommendations all except for Perry Rahi expiration 6:30 21. Maria Chow expires 6:30-22, and Jack Jem Jemski, Jemsik, sorry, expires 6:30-22. That motion's been made. Do I have a second? There's no second. The motion fails. So at this point, the motion on the floor is to refer the entire recommended appointee slate back to the planning board. Is there, I'm sorry, to OCA for the planning board. That would solve the problem. Uh, I'm sorry. OK. Um, to refer back to OCA, the planning board recommended appointees, the entire slate. Is there further discussion? Steve. So I think sending back to OCA without instructions is difficult because OCA has given us this recommendation, so I would expect OCA to come back with the same recommendation. But I think that we could give them work, like to consider what an associate does and to add that to the roster. So one of the recommendations, or one of, excuse me, one of the ideas is that in sending this recommendation back to OCA that they would explore the issue of uh, associates, what they might do, is the idea that they would then come back with added names for associates? Yeah, yes. George. I've heard two, clearly two very strong things listening to this conversation, which has been very enlightening, at least to me. And one is that a very eloquent plea by two members of the planning board 
uh, to uh, keep someone uh, who provides leadership and continuity and a sense of, of, as we said, institutional memory. And that seems to me a very good thing. I've also heard very clearly and eloquently expressed desire to have new voices and fresh voices on this body. Um, the chair, um, the OCA designee, Sarah, was very, I thought, very thoughtful and eloquent in saying that she was uncomfortable, understandably, with simply reappointing the same body again. And so she presented, I think, a very forceful and, and strong argument for the case that she made, um, which we're now struggling with. I could not vote for that because I could not bring myself to um, throw overboard uh, someone I felt was desperately needed for this body, and you've now heard two members of that body speak about that. So I hear two good things, that I would like to do both, um, and I feel like I'm forced into a corner. And if I am forced into a corner, I'm going to vote the way I voted um, on the uh, original recommendation, um, because there was a minority report, and two of us voted against this recommendation for the planning board. Um, I would prefer to vote yes for both, um, but at the moment, that doesn't seem to be an option. So if it does come back to uh, this body, back to OCA, um, I would expect that we would have that discussion, if the council so wishes, where we would try to see if there's a way um, to use associates to broaden the base of this body and, and still preserve uh, what I think is something extremely important, which is its institutional memory um, and its, its, uh, expertise, its knowledge base. So um, I feel caught. But if it comes back to us, that's what I'd assume we would be doing. I'd be like to hear what my fellow members think we would be doing if it comes back to us. Kathy. Um, I, when I'm looking at the people that have been recommended to us, I actually went out and Googled each of them, and particularly the new person that's being recommended that would be new on the board, and I found an incredibly talented person with a very rich experience, both starting with law and law clerk internship, but then moving from a series of issues, environmental indigen and indigenous people, and then moving to mediator. This is a person who works really well with new, tackling new issues, and she's a long time person who's been participating and watching the planning board. So I think we've been proposed a very strong slate. What I'm not sure is if people are saying the one person who has not been recommended for returning, whether they would rather have one of the returning people not be there and have their chair continue. You know, so it's focused on one new person. We have an alternative. Um, it, we just have a very strong new person being, being uh, proposed to us. So it, the going back without giving some guidance, um, we've, we've got a good group. Uh, so what is our guidance? Are there further uh, hold on, Sarah. Steve. So all due respect to <laughs> Kathy, I, the nightmare solution is we're all, we're all here Googling the candidates because this should be, we should be getting better information than this. We have a responsibility to, you know, the planning board is a very important board for <laughs> the town and we shouldn't be relying on the other person doesn't have the opportunity to be Google because he's not on the list. So. I have no idea which one is the better. I have no idea what's been mentioned earlier. If there's a diversity of opinions, that's all 100% hearsay. We have no idea what these candidates stand for. There's been no litmus test. We don't know um, if what the ideology of the two planning board members that spoke earlier are. So we're completely shooting the blind. We're not doing our fiduciary duty to be to making a reasonable appointment here. I'm completely uncomfortable with this process. I'm also uncomfortable with referring this back to OCA because it's OCA that has given us you know, these names. So I'm wondering if there's another solution which is to simply punt the decision for a year and come up with a better process for next year. Sarah. So I realize that I'm really, really close to this process, right? And I'm hearing what everyone is, is saying. I will say that if, from, <laughs> we, we haven't had an associate to the planning board for 20 years. From what I understand, the associate would have little, they would have no vote, and they would have little or no contact actually with 
the planning board. Now that could be different than what I understand it. Um, I, and I would need to understand it. If you sent that back to OCA, then we would need to then somehow figure out, do you want one associate? Do you want three associates? And what actually do they, they do? To me, what it really feels like we're saying right now, <laughs> what we are saying now is that a whole bunch of people would like to have the board return the way it was, and you're offering a, like, <laughs> A complete, almost completely undefined associate membership to someone, and it, it feels to me like what you, I understand everybody wanting to be kind to one person, but you're not actually offering them anything of substance that would help them along. And, and I really would feel like if you brought that back to OCA, then we'd have to really kind of think long and hard and also define what, what an associate means. Pat. I feel like um, it's starting to sound to me like kids who didn't get what they wanted, so let's postpone, let's postpone. The work has been done. There have been recommendations made. I think that we need to move forward now and get this committee working, not wait a year to, so I can have what I want, or you can have what you want, or you can have what you want. I think we need to uh, address these uh, recommendations now and be honest about it. Stop, stop playing games. Uh, Dorothy. Um, just following up on that, it was mentioned earlier today that we had uh, a very talented town planning staff that can aid and guide the planning board. We must not forget that. And um, the person who is not being reappointed in this um, proposal, if we clarify our term limits and clarify how long a person has to be off the board before they can reapply, we're not saying that this person's expertise will be lost to us forever. We're saying we need to, do add, we need to add somebody new and start bringing new people on as well as keeping on the experienced ones. So I, I don't think that, it's, that we have to think that we're losing that expertise, but we need to clarify our term limits policy and have it in place when we do this again. Andy. So let me get, try it from a slightly different perspective and then um, I will let it go to where it goes. In my work on the Finance Committee um, has been interesting for me. I had some hesitation about coming back to the Finance Committee after having been on a prior finance committee um, and having chaired a prior finance committee. But I agreed to do it because I felt that the committee would benefit from a long-term institutional history and an understanding not just of what we do, but why we do it and why we got to the place that we got. And, um, I'm glad that I ended up saying that I would be chair of the Finance Committee, even though I was uh, originally looking to do new, new things as a council, counselor, as I think all of us were. Um, and it's sort of in the same vein that I'm concerned and expressed my prior concern, because I think we've heard very persuasive arguments that go along the lines for the Planning Board, what my experience was with the Finance Committee, that. Um, the Finance Committee takes several years, and the Planning Board apparently takes several years, to really gain the kind of experience and depth of knowledge that is really required to provide the guidance and leadership in history that is provided, that, that is needed for a Board or Committee. And that's what I was trying to express at the beginning, and I don't want this to be about one or two individuals. I wanted to, that's why I would uh, prefer that the committee kind of look at it if, it get, if this passes and look at the whole process to think about those issues and maybe even delve into them a little bit further with members of the planning board. The other thing is that um, a mention was made about planning staff um, providing the history. And I think that for me, that's like the Finance Committee providing the history that um, 
do we want the history to come within our citizen members of boards or committees or within our professional groups? And what is the consequences for us if we take the view that all of our history should be um, what is provided to us um, from the professional staff? And then that's the other aspect, and I did mention that earlier, um, but I thought it was, uh, because it was mentioned just now, I wanted to bring it up and just touch on it a little bit more fully. Thank you. Evan. So there's, there's three things I want to say. Two of them should be brief. Um, one is that, you know, I, like Sarah, am very close to this process. I helped develop it. I, every diagram you've seen, I have put together. Um, but I'm also not necessarily here tonight to be a staunch defender of the process, um, especially because my, my main interest has been, what do you all think? We just did this. Um, and I heard from at least five, maybe six people sitting here tonight, uh, statements of concern about the process, and also statements that they did not feel like they had enough information. And so I'm personally amenable to a motion to refer back to OCA, specifically because we intentionally put this on the agenda for tonight so that we would have time before that deadline, so that if we heard the type of concerns we heard from the council that we did, we would have the option to reconvene as a committee and discuss them. And so as a committee member, although I don't want to assign myself more work, um, I, I am not opposed to this coming back to the committee given the number of concerns that were raised tonight and given the number of things that were said. My concern would be, of course, is if you refer this back to OCA and we meet on June 3rd, which would be our next scheduled meeting where we could discuss this, uh, I think that the five of us will sit down and go, so it was referred to us. What now? And so should a referral come, uh, should a referral pass, I think the committee would benefit from uh, some guidance as to what you're looking for us to do. But I do think uh, it's not an unreasonable request to come back to committee, given many of the things that have been said tonight, including by people who support the, the, the number, the, the candidates who have been put forth, but who have said, I'm supporting this, but I don't necessarily know that I have enough information, which I've heard. Um, but, you know, I wanted to speak because uh, George spoke a little bit. Uh, obviously, anyone who read the report knows that this was a 3-2 vote. Um, George spoke about his vote, uh, and so it seems only appropriate for me as the second of the two to speak of mine. Um, I understand uh, the loss of institutional knowledge, uh, but I think that it's important at times to bring new members into committees. I'm really supportive of the idea of bringing new, new blood and new people into committees. Um, when I looked at the pool of applicants for planning board, I didn't see it. And I, I thought that when I looked at the pool, I felt that we had a pool that was really lacking in candidates um, because I didn't see new voices. Um, we're defining new voices as people who are not on the planning board. To me, that's not a new voice, right? A new voice is someone who's new to the conversation. And so if we look at this town council, I think that we've been working really effectively. And one of the reasons is we have some people who have been doing this for a long time, right? We have some people who have been doing this for several years, but there are some people on this council, myself included, including the person to my left and some people across from me, who, who are really brand new to the conversation and politics in our town. And I think that we've benefited from that. One of the reasons I voted very strongly in favor of the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, recommendation is that there were some truly new voices. Mr. Wilk was on there, for those of you who read his bio. He graduated UMass in 2017. He's not been at all involved in town politics. He is literally a new voice. I just finished doing the interviews for Ranked Choice Voting, which we'll be bringing to you in our, probably at our next meeting. There were new people, truly new people, who had said, I have never been involved in the town's politics at all. They were new voices. What I saw in the pool of applicants for planning board was not new voices. What I saw in the, pl the, the, the pool was old voices. I saw old voices who are on the planning board and old voices who are not on the planning board. Um, and what I mean by that, and that's not an age thing, right? That's a, um, what I mean by that is I have only paid attention to town politics in the, in the recent past. 
and I recognized every name on those CAFs. And to me, that was a problem. I didn't recognize every name on the Zoning Board of Appeal CAFs. I didn't recognize every name on the Ranked Choice Voting CAFs. There were new people who were brought in. And so to me, if we're going to say we want new voices and new blood, that doesn't just mean someone who's not currently on the committee. That means someone who's bringing a truly new voice to the conversation. But every person who applied, whether they were on the committee or not, has been in the conversation for a long time. My vote was to, my vote was basically to say, OCA didn't do a good enough job recruiting for this committee, and we need more time to do so. We have been very focused on the appointments process. We have not focused on the outreach and communications part of our charge yet. And I think that was clear in the lack of new voices in the pool and in the lack of diversity in the pool. I think we need to recruit more people. I think that we had uh, an insufficient pool. And so my personal preference in my vote was, was to basically say, let's take some more time. Let's try to recruit a stronger pool so we have a larger pool of candidates um, from which we can derive um, some new people. I'm going to step out of my role as president and speak as a counselor. We started down a very, very tough road in this town when John Musanti passed away. Then we moved on to a new form of government. And in that form of government, we moved on to a different construction of various committees, planning board and zoning board being among those. And during that entire time, once we voted on the charter that we now live with, we were not allowed, the select board was not allowed to do any appointments unless it was absolutely necessary. So the planning board, which had nine people, lost one because he came on the council. Nice to have a little experience in planning over here. They lost another because of his own illness, and they lost a third because he stepped down because we needed to get the committee to seven. So that's one piece. Another piece I wanna share with you, and that is I'm probably one of the people that is most guilty of leaning on Andy Steinberg to head up finance committee because not only as president of this council but as a counselor I needed that strong knowledge that Andy brought I needed that history and I needed to know that I had him to, to rely on and for Alyssa I say the same we have our moments right Alyssa <laughs> But we sat down just the other day and worked through a timeline for how to evaluate the town manager. And we worked through a process to take it back to OCA that's important for this. So my message back to OCA, should we refer, is to consider history is important. I even have a minor in history, okay? Uh, I actually, um, really disparage people who feel like history is not important. History is very important. And I ask that you also seriously consider the possibility of going with the bylaw and with the charge to the committee and in a rapid order and to any way you know I will help figure out what an associate would be like and how you would do that. I embrace your efforts. I have watched Sarah struggle through this process. I have gone to more OCA committee meetings than any other committee except for finance. And so I applaud them in the effort that they have made. And I know that as we're done with this whole round of appointments, as a council, we will come back with a much better process that the public will uh, enjoy. Thank you. Pat. Thank you for your eloquence. Um, it was quite moving, honestly. Um, and I value history. Um, but history, like everything else, gets distorted. Um, and we buy what we want to carry and say is true. Um, and I don't say that lightly to you at all. Um, my feeling very strongly is that you're right. We can spend time to create these associate positions. Uh, but I do not think that should impede or stop the vote tonight on the candidates that have been recommended. Okay. Mandy Shaw. 
So, um, I have struggled with what to do with this decision for a couple days now. Um, but I think we've been tapping around, that might not be the right word, the real issue here, which is this vote is politics. This is, we, you know, we haven't said it, but planning board does deals with planning and there in general are two views, more than two views, but potentially two camps in town about how to look at that. And one of, and the discussion between this in a sense is, do we vote for someone that some of us may or may not agree with their views on and others may or may not agree with their views on or do we vote for someone else who may or may, we may or may not agree with? We should just put that out there that part of the reason this is being hard is because it really is about politics. Um, and some of us were put and elected and ran on certain views for planning and zoning and may feel our votes here need to reflect that. Um, a referral basically says we don't like that pool, come back with something else, I think. Um, because we can vote on this, this recommendation tonight and OCA can still come back with a recommendation in a week for associates or alternates, whatever you want to call them, that are already in the, z the zoning bylaw and give us two more names to start that process. So referring back is essentially saying we don't want these names. We want different names. That's not necessarily different from just voting on the names. Um, one thing I would like to know is um, can associates chair a committee? They might not have voting power, but they might be able to chair. Um, I, the zoning, the charge that I read, and I read it very briefly, just says that there are two non-voting associates, <laughs> and then that's, then it's like silent. Um, but it's there, it's allowed. Th that might be a way to keep some um, experience on this committee, but I don't think we should be referring a matter back to a committee just because we want to avoid a vote on names unless because that you don't want those same names coming back if you're referring it back just admit it um, and then vote on it and admit that right now we could just have oka come back with two associate ones if we really want associates um i still don't know what i'm going to do but i thought i'd just put out there that it really is probably about politics and whose views we think best represent our views Alyssa. So just to be really, really clear, because I can see that Steve's already going to argue with me, what Cambridge does, what other people do with associates is completely irrelevant to this conversation right now. Right now, we haven't had them for 20 years. We would have to define it. Um, my fellow colleague on OCA, George, thinks we have time to do that. I disagree completely. Um, it is, there is only one thing in Mass General Law that it says planning board associates do. Other communities do other things with them, but you can't just decide that as the appointing authority that they get to do those things. This We don't get to write their charge. The old charge documents, we do not get to write the zoning board and planning board charges. Those charges are old garbage pulled together over years that we'd never fixed over time. It's one of the things we probably need to look at, but it does not, they don't address the actual associate job. And so that does need to be a process, whether you think we can do it quickly. I, George can say we can, I can say we can't. But I do think that needs to be clear if you do vote to refer, if that's what you want to come back to you as part of this, in addition to supporting the things that my colleague Mandy Jo just said when I was flabbergasted to hear that zoning was not political, because that certainly has not been my experience in life. Steve. So, um, actually, no argument here, but I was, but I was going to uh, talk to my uh, colleague from District 4 and saying maybe this is an age thing, but when you get to be my age, there are, there are a lot of new voices on here. So there are people that I count a number of people of the seven here whose introduction to town politics was through the planning board. So basically, they've been involved in the conversation for three years. And it's actually an extraordinary group. So I might be in a privileged position where I know every single one of these people reasonably well. And 
you know, I think one through four are extraordinary candidates. So I feel that I'm privileged to know, you know, each of them in a different way, and I think they're great. And I think that the other CAFs that are left on the table also had some great people there. So I, <laughs> I'm twisted in this argument as everyone else is, because I think that one through four are highly qualified for this. And so really my dilemma here really has 100% to do with the fact that we are just getting, we're like the draft that's finally gotten up, right? And so now um, this is all gonna happen in four weeks and particularly our CRC, Community Resource Committee, we have responsibility of the master plan, you know, a backlog apparently of zoning bylaw changes and the person that has that inside his head is not on the list. So that's really where my dilemma is. I'm all for change. I'm all for ones through four. And, you know, I think they're great. But I'm also for <laughs> number five, who's not on the list. And so I don't know how to reconcile that, especially through our responsibility of being the keepers of the, well, along with the planning, we're the keepers of the master plan, plus the, the group that's working on zoning subcommittee. Uh, I'm sorry, zoning bylaw issues. Sarah. So I'm still hearing everyone, and, and like I said, I'm close to this process, and I said I wasn't going to take this personally, and obviously I did, but I, I also did say that once this is done and over with and we all agree on it, I'm just leaving it here and, and I'm moving on. Um, I think it's because I really gave this so much thought that it seems like it's my, I guess it is my baby. Like I do feel in some ways like you are, you know, you're kind of like you're, you're poking at my baby. Your ears are too big or, you know, like... So what I'm going to say is for me, I realize where this conversation is coming, and I know what Mandy Joe is saying, and, and in part that is, you know, is this political? Someone came right directly at me when this, when I made these decisions and said, well, obviously this is political, and common sense needs to reign. And I, that somehow that kind of rankled me just because I felt like, well, I, I think that in the whole world, especially farming and everything else I do, common sense is the thing that drives me. So this whole, we all as a team have to figure this out. And, and I totally get that. I just want to say when I sat down to try to figure this out, I, I did want to bring in someone new and I totally hear what Evan is, is saying, um, but it wasn't political. I do think we have to look at terms. If you disagree what I say with that and you think that it's, uh, it's something that you know, we want to bring you know, experience along. But I also did have to think about, and I don't know if this is political or if it's just like when you say, like, I'm really listening to what my constituents say. So I do think there's, there is a, a feeling out there of some people that you know, and I, it's, I don't not respect our planning board or our zoning board. I do very, very much. I just was looking at, I, I felt like it was still a strong committee. And obviously I'm going to, you know, to listen to them if they say they don't feel like they are. I did feel like they were strong and I did feel like there was some merit of putting someone new on. And I guess... I guess think about that and try to remove yourself from either personal feelings or political feelings because I really felt like that's what I was trying to do. Um, and I'm not op opposed to, you know, if people are saying, you know, we want to vote to keep it all the same or, you know, I think we should, you know, keep a space open or let the, it stay the way it is for a year until we increase the pool. But when you're doing that, please try to do what I did, which was sit down and say to myself, Am I creating a healthy board that also is in response to what constituents want? And if the answer is no, then that's fine, but I, I, I ask you to not make it political. There's a question before the council, and it is a question to refer. Is there any further comments on the question to refer back to OCA, the planning board recommended appointees? If not, I'm going to call the question. All of those in favor of referring the slate for the planning board recommended appointees back to OCA, please raise your hand. The motion fails. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, the, all of those, please raise your hands who were in favor of referral. And keep them up. One, two, three, four, five, five. Opposed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And abstain. So it's five, seven, one. So the motion fails. I'm waiting to hear the next motion. Pat. I move that, I move that we accept the recommendations for planning board from OCA. Okay, that specific motion is actually on your motion sheet and needs to be read. Um, so it's to appoint the planning board under the Amherst Home Rule char Charter Section 2.9C for terms commencing s July, July 1st, 2019. Maria Cho and Jack Jemsik, whose terms shall expire June 30th, 2022. And Pari Raya and Janet McGowan, whose term shall expire June 30th, 2021, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. The motion's been made by Pat. Is there a second? I will second it. Okay, further discussion? Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor of approving the slate as presented to you here. Opposed? Abstain. Motion passes, and that is our new appointees to the planning board. Yes. Can I move to refer the discussion regarding associate slash alternate members, whatever we're calling them, that are listed in the current planning board charge slash bylaw to the OCA committee. Is there a second? Shalini is seconded. Is there further conversation? I didn't hear the, to what? To the OCA committee. The, the motion's been made and seconded. Yes, re please repeat the motion. I move to refer the decision, the, the discussion regarding associate members as stated in the current planning board charge to the OCA committee. Mandy Jo, would you like to speak to it of what you Perfect. think they're to do with it? Sh sure, I'll speak to it. I there there is in the planning com planning board charge a listing that it can have two associate members. I would love to see OCA committee come back with, should we appoint them, should we not, and if so, who? And what their role is? I don't know whether that's part of, I mean, the charge says there can be two associate members. Okay. I, I don't know whether we define the, that or whether the planning board, once they're appointed, defines that, but the charge allows for those members. Alyssa. So, no, because I want it to be referred to GOL. Yeah. That's where it belongs, because it's actually an outgrowth of rules and bylaws, and it absolutely will be something that comes, because bylaws interacts with MGL in terms of okay. what can associates do. We know they can do special permits. We're not sure what else they might be able to do. And then what we can make up is probably planning board regulations rather than okay. the motion. town council things. So I think it's GOLs. The motion is made and seconded that it be referred to OCA. The Can you please let us know who seconded that? Um, Shalini. Yes. And the discussion now seems to suggest that this might be the wrong committee. Uh, is there further conversation about that? Can yes, I just Steve. Um, I completely concur that it's not an OCA issue. It, OCA deals with actual humans for actual slots. In my opinion, and GOL deals with more policy. 
Yeah, I actually see that as a friendly amendment to the idea we need to figure okay. this out. Yeah. So if, uh, is somebody going to make this as a friendly amendment? Mm. Okay. That it be referred to OCA instead? No, no, rules, GOL. I'm sorry, to GOL instead, GOL. I, I will make that motion. And is there a second? Uh, she, Kathy is a second. Is there further conversation? So the point of my motion was to essentially have OCA come back with names for associates, not for a decision on what do they do. And so that should not be in GOL. That should be in OCA, because the charge allows for associates. So. I want associates appointed, okay. and me, so I want OCA to come back with names. So, so you it's, meant it's, recommendations of names, not it, recommendations. Essentially, I think I think the issue that we're dealing with is some feeling that there needs to be. Okay, this is the planning board. These are associates. These are what associates do. This is what associates should be appointed for. It's all around our governance in, that would involve planning and associates. And then it would go back to OCA for those appointments. That would be my observation. All right, so the motion on the floor is to refer this to OCA. I'm sorry, to GOL. Whew. I hate acronyms. To refer to GOL. Mandy Joe, did you accept that? I, I haven't. I think it's a motion to amend to refer to GOL instead of OCA. Okay, it's a motion to amend this, that it be referred to GOL instead of OCA. But here's my problem. The way the original motion was, they were supposed to debate it and come back with potential appointees. GOL would not do that. So I think we need to have a couple withdrawals and clean this up. I withdraw my motion, whatever it was. Okay, all right. We're withdrawing, strike the record. We're gonna start over. I'm going to make a motion that this be referred to GOL to define the associates to the planning board, their role, their purpose, their terms, and that subsequently it would go to OCA for recommending appointments to those positions. Is there a second? <laughs> Pat. Pat. <laughs> Further discussion? Um, I just have a, a question for Mandy Jo. Uh, is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, got, I kind of got the impression that you were bringing it up as a possibility for the current planning board chair to possibly get, have that position at, as associate member and continue to be able to advise, et cetera. I was. I thought so. Just clarify. It's my motion to refer to OCA so that maybe some appointments could come back I, and there'd I be got that. I full got that. ability to participate other than vote. Work fast. We meet, we meet again on June 3rd. Do you need to take a vote on the motion? Yes, we do. <laughs> Yes, but where are we Evan. Going? So if I'm understanding correctly, what's being thrown out right now is we will tell GOL that GOL has to come up with what the role of associates is. Is that, is that, so my first question is, would that require a change to the zoning bylaw? Would it not? Right, if we're the zoning bylaw allows for associates. Right, but if we're, if we're, we're essentially then GOL is telling the planning board what their members are allowed to do. Uh, is that what's? GOL is coming back to the council, 
The council is the governing body of Amherst. The council can say to the planning board, these are associates and these is what, this is what they do. And now we turn it back over to Oka and Oka comes back to us with names. It seems to me, and not to throw another wrench into this. It doesn't um, mean they shouldn't consult with a planning board. It just means that the planning board does not make that decision. But is it not an interpretation of the zoning bylaw? The zoning bylaw says that can have associates, and then we're saying we're going to read into the zoning bylaw what those associates can do, and would that not more reasonably sit with CRC? <laughs> No. Look, I'm on OCA and GOL. I'm just trying to get rid of this. No. 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 <laughs> no. Uh, uh, Steve. Yeah, so can, maybe we need a cooling off period because I think the, the urgency of the associates had to do with a particular situation which is now dispensed of. And I think that we need time to uh, dispense. Yeah, so I, I think we need some time, and I, I think we need to consider the zoning bylaw revisions that we're going to get anyway, you know, in, as a whole. So this can definitely be part of that. But Shalini. Oh, okay. But also the depth of the bench. So yeah. Shalini. What I heard was that having the associates would allow us to still address the, some of the issues we were having earlier on with the ins retaining some of the institutional memories. So it is still. There's a motion on the floor. The motion on the floor is to refer this to GOL to define associates including length of term, and then to have it come back to the council and refer to OCA for nominations to those positions. Yes. This is, as Steve said, this is motivated by a very particular situation. The council has just voted and made its decision. So I think the issue has been decided. I don't see any point in pursuing this any further unless planning or someone else comes to us and says, we're really excited about the idea of associates. The idea of associates was brought up this evening as a way to deal with this, what I saw as a dilemma. Um, the decision has been made, um, so I think at this point it should just be dropped. Not referred to anybody. And I'm on OCA and GOL. And, <laughs> and if it comes to either one, yeah. Shalini. I think if you're getting more people to participate in this very involved committee, why not? I mean, I'm a big believer, as you will see later on, for bigger committees that have big charges. So if we can get very experienced and intelligent, hardworking people saying they want to join, and we're like, no, no, we're done. You know, and if you have that option to bring in two more people, I don't see why we wouldn't. Dorothy. Um, I'm, I'm agreeing with George. Um, I think that the question of associates is one that we will be discussing and thinking about in the future. But I think that um, this kind of quick moving to this committee, that committee has a very rushed look about it. And um, I think that we want to go back to something that was said earlier, which is much stronger outreach in reaching for um, new people to participate. I, I think that some good steps have been made in that. Um, I think the town manager's appointments, whenever they get um, brought up, that uh, I think he's done that. Um, I see some new people uh, being put forward. But um, so I, I would not be for this, uh, sending it to this committee and then that committee at this time. Any further discussion? Call, yes, Mandy Jo. So I, I just want to reiterate that the current committee charge says non-voting liaisons, two alternates are normally appointed. I don't see how without modifying that charge, GOL could do anything to define what associates do. But, with, but the council could appoint two alternates as of today because the charge says right in it, two alternates are normally appointed. So we could do the appointing but I don't think we can define the role without formally modifying that charge. 
and that's if the council wants to formally modify that charge to define the role versus allowing the planning board itself to define the role, then it should come to GOL. But if we actually want to put alternates on this board, we have every right to do so under the committee right now. And if that's the case, then it should be going to OCA for recommendations to the alternates. All right, so the motion on the floor is to refer this to GOL and then for definition and then back to OCA. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of that referral process, raise your hands. To GOL. To GOL and then back to OCA. Okay, the motion dies. Ask for the nose and Abstain. All right. Any further discussion on this at this time? Darcy. I just feel compelled to say one thing about old voices. Um, because I think that they're, you know, we have all these people who've served on town meeting for years and years probably four or 500 people in town, counting all the you know, most recent and former members, who have a massive amount of knowledge and, and expertise and understanding of town government. And I really don't consider them old voices. I think that we should really be taking advantage of everybody. And if they can be associate members someday, that would be great. But I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Any further comments on this? Alyssa. I was just going to ask quickly if at another time, perhaps not tonight, we wanted to do some outreach as a council so through you or another body of this council to talk to the planning board about they know how they're legally allowed to use ZBA associates. So when we explain that to people in an interview, we can say these are the kinds of things you would get to do. I will be I, glad to do We don't that. know that for planning board associates. So we could ask them. Okay. Thank you. Any further conversation on this? Moving on to the next. So we're going back to the original order of the agenda where the, ne the next is the discussion of the GOL committee charge. We have slides for this. Mandy Joe. Thank you. I'm going to try and keep this short because the slides nearly identically trace what I wrote in my report, and I'm sure everyone read the report. GOL, for a long number of meetings, has dis been discussing its charge and the scope of its charge. And so we have some wording up there in bold italics that says, review and make recommendations on matters referred to the GOL regarding policies, actions, or measures proposed for action by the town council for which no other appropriate council committee exists to perform such review. We don't know what to do with that wording, number one. And so I've put three options there that the GOL committee discussed. One is ignore it, don't do anything, keep everything as is. The second is to put that language into a new standing committee. And the third is to add that language to GOL. Um, so Margaret, the second slide. So, oh, she skipped option one, which is do nothing. Um, the reason we've been struggling with this is GOL has noticed that a lot of ad hoc committees have been being formed. And GOL in its discussions believed that the council should have a place for every measure that comes to it for discussions on policy and substance. And by the formation of lots of ad hoc committees, it is clear we don't have a standing committee place for everything that comes to us. And so what to do about that? Um, if you like what we've been doing, which is ad hoc committees, you would stick with option one, which keeps that, but you know, keeps more standing, more ad hoc committees coming. Um, it maintains, and I'll get into this in option two, it maintains GOL as a non-policy considering committee. So can we get to the second slide? Thank you. Um, we ran into a dilemma. The dilemma is create a sixth standing committee to handle measure proposals that don't really have another standing committee to go to, um, or put it into the GOL charge. 
And the GOL committee didn't know what to do and where it would fall. Because creating a six standing committee has the benefits of rem keeping GOL truly a non-policy considering committee that just looks at clarity, consistency, actionability on measures um, without regard to whether we support or don't support and whether the policy is good or bad or we believe it's good or bad. Um, and we believe there are benefits to having a committee like that. But the drawback is it creates a sixth standing committee. And we are all already on multiple standing committees and you can see 23 appointments already to not standing committees and at least 11 to non-council committees and seven on an ongoing basis. Adding yet another committee of five members puts a lot of pressure on us. So we didn't really like that option per se, but can we get the third slide, thanks. We didn't really like this one either, um, which is revise the GOL charge to put that into that language into the charge, which makes GOL kind of the committee of last resort. Um, other phrases have been bad, bad bandied about in committee that I won't use, but um, the benefits are every, there would be a committee for everything, a standing committee for everything. Um, the drawback is GOL would no longer be a neutral reviewer. And so that's, that's basically the whole thing. I, I don't think there's any other slides, are there? No, no, there that was no. the last one. Um, and so we ultimately after multiple meetings said, what does the council think? And so can we have this discussion in the council to see where the council might be now that we've got multiple standing committees formed, we've operated for a couple months, where might the council be? And so that's why we're here tonight asking you guys to give us some of your opinions on this. I want to point out that this is an item for discussion, not necessarily for vote, and the floor is open for discussion. Kathy. Um, I potentially like your option three with um, a slight variation on it. Um, as we were sitting on the rules of procedure ad hoc group, um, we were looking across towns and there are all sorts of committee structures out there. And what I think we might be able to do with this is recognize where there's a cluster of issues that didn't fit anywhere. And that might give you the definition of another committee or a way of splitting our committees. And what we are proposing in our rules is that we look at our organization at least annually to say, is it working well? You know, do we have the right committees? Have we split it up right? So this might provide an alternative, but I would see it as temporary. You know, so it's, it's a way of thinking, are there a cluster of issues? And then see what they look like. You know, if they're all over the place, we have, we have the uh, collection bin <laughs> of the last resort thing. So that's what I'm not sure what won't fit. And we have this new one that is so broad that I'm waiting to see what doesn't fit it. Um, yes, Dorothy. Well, I think if you make it, they will come. Um, I do not want the third committee. I like the option one. I don't think we have to have a committee where everything automatically goes, and I see nothing wrong with us deciding appropriately when we need or do not need an ad hoc committee. I think GOL works when it stays off of the content, and we've, we've had this discussion at a couple of meetings already, and we do appreciate the work that GOL does, um, but I think we don't need to have, we don't need to be so tidy that we have an automatic place for everything. We'll figure it out as we go along. Darcy. Uh, I would agree with Dorothy. I, I feel like it's a little premature. Um, I think that GOL is one of our very most organized committees. And um, I, I think you might be getting ahead of yourself a little bit. It feels like, you know, we're, we needed a number of ad hoc committees as we've been getting started. But as we continue, we're probably going to need fewer, um, and um, I feel like, you know, we could conceivably look at this in another year and see if something is needed. But um, I, I also feel like, you know, GOL is special in that it is neutral, and I think that that is it's one of its strong points, and I would like to keep it that way if at all possible, and not get into 
content areas if possible. Evan? So as a member of GOL, I've been involved, heavily involved in these decisions and um, my colleagues on GOL have been not surprised when I say that I don't like any of these options, um, and, that's a, and that's a problem. Uh, I would respectfully disagree with some of my colleagues. I actually do think that uh, we should have a home committee for everything. I think it's important that when legis I think it's important not just for us, but I think it's important for the public who might be bringing forth petitions and policies to know when they bring it forth to the council, it will go to the council and then be referred to a committee. And so I think it's really important for us for the process and for the public that anyone bringing forth a policy knows where that policy will go. Um, Kathy asked the question of, well, what might not fit into this? So I believe next on our agenda is rules, and then we'll be discussing a uh, draft campaign finance bylaw being brought forward by uh, Mandy Joe and myself. That doesn't fit in any committee that we currently have. And so if you look at the agenda, it says referral. It doesn't say referral to any committee, and that's because there is no committee to which that reasonably belongs. And so tonight, in you know, some amount of time, we're gonna have a discussion of what do we do with a bylaw that doesn't fit into any committee. So I, I would say I also respect the idea that GOL should be neutral. I think it should, I like it as a neutral technical committee. And I think this puts the council in a really difficult position of, so if we agree that every, every measure should have a home, and some measures won't logically fit in the committees we have, where do those measures go? Uh, I think ad hoc committees are a really bad way to go about doing things. I think that it was fine in the beginning. We were getting our footing. Uh, ad hoc committees put an extra burden on us. We're already serving a number of committees. They add additional committees. But ad hoc committees are actually really terrible for the public. Um, and I think when you think of public participation and transparency, um, ad hoc committees have unpredictable meeting schedules. They're hard to follow. And so if we really want an engaged public who feels comfortable bringing policy, we want them to know where their, docu their, where their policy is going to go and when that committee meets. We don't want to just be creating all these ad hoc committees. So I think it's, I think I, I don't necessarily, I'm not lobbying for any particular option, but I do want to put out there that ad hoc committees aren't great for public participation and also um, that there will be a measure tonight that we're looking at that, that we'll, we'll face this challenge with. Additional comments? Alyssa. So I'm, I'm going to admit that I didn't spend hours poring over this report. It's pretty extensive and I'm not sure I'm ideally really dicing it out the way I need to. So I'll say what I want from the process and then you can tell me which one it fits in. <laughs> I want to be able to refer the campaign finance there to GOL or another body that isn't one of the bodies we already have. I don't think it belongs in CRC. I want rules, when we're done with the rules, to go to GOL and by necessity, it's not gonna just be technical fixes. They're gonna be opinions that are involved just like there were opinions involved in bringing rules this far. I want when bylaw review is done with their work as specified by the charter, that GOL, or to be named committee, does that. And if, if those things go someplace else other than to GOL, like yet another standing committee, then I feel like we are really pulling, that then GOL just has less and less to do. And I'm, I appreciate their technical nature and everything they're being able to set up technically for us now but I think they can evolve into that thing, and I've been assuming they are going to evolve into that thing for the purpose of rules and bylaws already, and I'd love to see, like we say, things um, that we don't clearly fit in CRC or that make sense that we can send over to them. So I am totally willing to give up the idea of GOL being neutral, as it has been right now, as part of our evolution. Could you please go back to the beginning slide? Okay. So the the, fr the sentence is review and re make recommendations on matters referred to the GOL regarding policies, actions, and measures proposed for action by the town council for which no other appropriate council committee exists to perform such review. And option one says do nothing. Option two says create yet another committee. Option three says revised GOL's charge so that it includes this sentence. And I also just want to again reiterate, no committee of the council 
makes policy for the council. They recommend it back to the council. So it's not like GOL would be the last word. Further conversation on this. As someone who sits on CRC and GOL, I don't want CRC to become a dump. And there are lots of things that don't belong in it. We're really gonna be looking at the master plan. We're gonna be looking at ways in that the town is impacted by the decisions made by other groups. So I think um, we should think about changing the GOL charge. Okay. All right, so this is at, at this moment a discussion item. However, it could be turned into a vote. It's up to you. So, so and I'm, I'm speaking, Evan, I'm, yes. Sorry. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of GOL. I don't think that I would prefer the council take an official vote on this, but GOL is in the process of reviewing its charge, and I'm wondering, and I would, I would ask this of my committee members first, um, if much like rules had a couple of just little straw votes, if it would be appropriate for the non-GO, ask the non-GOL members just as a straw vote what they prefer. I would never ask just part of the council to vote. It's either an all council vote or not. Dorsey. Um, it seems like a lot of, you know, new measures will come to us by uh, counselors who have an interest in a particular topic and um, I I guess I feel uncomfortable with everything being referred to GOL that doesn't have another home I think it actually does make more sense to go to an ad hoc committee made of people that are interested in that issue Did, which this is doesn't, what we've done in the past this does not prevent ad hoc committees in my mind I thought that's what it was doing. I thought it was instead of ad hoc committees. Um, so, I, yeah, my point is okay. that I, it, it seems to me to, to have, you know, to put too much power into GOL to be the arbiter of all things that don't fit somewhere else when I could see where I might want to be on a committee about some new measure. Kathy. A simple amendment to the ad words of appropriate council or, or ad hoc committee would, you know, so if we would decide that we want an ad hoc committee, we could, or we could just refer this particular measure. So we've got one example. I mean, I think leaving ourselves open to that decision when events come up. So campaign finance is a good example of one that you might just want a quick read on it rather than set up a whole new committee, or might not, but I, it's a way of, so I think it could be fixed to not imply there shall never be ad hoc committees. I didn't read it as that. The charter does allow ad hoc committees and I don't think that we're doing this to create something absent of the charter. Mandy Jo, do you wanna to speak to that? So the goal was to limit the creation of ad hoc committees, yeah. not right. prohibit them. But you know, when you look at <clears throat> when someone brings a measure, this isn't necessarily a committee to create the measure, this is a committee to review a measure that has already been proposed, which I think is different than a committee to create something we're interested in, right. which probably should have maybe an ad hoc committee or be a more substantial policy committee. Um, but for something like campaign finance, there's other bylaws um, where there's, you, you're gonna want maybe a pro and con review on the policy behind the measure, not just is it clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, and the question is where does that policy review belong? Um, and that's where GOL was, was debating a standing, and I think any policy review like that 
my opinion personally is it belongs in a standing committee, not an ad hoc committee. We should have standing committees that can that are set up to review any policy that gets proposed to the council. Um, and so this was an attempt to figure out what to do with that, with a recognition that CRC has quite a broad policy review um, charge right now, actually, for recommendations. That language was closely tracks the CRC charge for that particular bullet point. Um, you can substitute CRC and then proposed for action after that in the CRC charge was all the different, it was the like bullet point list of refuse and energy and master plan, it was the list. Um, and so you know, these are not the only options, these were the ones we were struggling over for a meantime because there were other options we, as GOL mentioned, um, and the report mentions that we didn't think were appropriate to bring forth at this time as actual options, and that included modifications of CRC's charge, which is why they're not discussed here, because CRC hasn't had a chance to figure itself out. And so we thought that would be well premature to say, we just created you and now you're too broad, let's bring it back um, and do something else, which is why this was sort of a, at this point, something to get us through maybe until that annual review and see so that there was standing committees to deal with all policy Are there other, other questions or comments? George. So do people feel like there's this really big problem to which we desperately need a solution? I don't have that feeling. So um, I think this is something for the moment. When in doubt, do nothing. We have three options here. Let's let it sit for a while. We may come back in four or six months when we do our review, and we'll come back to this and we'll say, by God, option three is desperately what we need. But right now I hear everything all over the map, including Evan's point that none of them are good enough. So for the moment, I think um, we, let's let it sit. Alyssa. So is that a problem, Andy Joe? then, for by, given the rules that we're going to talk about in a few minutes that say we're going to have automatic referrals of bylaws to GOL and that if, if there isn't some other committee that's also working on it and GOL is just supposed to serve as the technical part, if other bylaws are getting... Uh, what? <laughs> Where are we going with that? So right now the GOL charge, every bylaw does come to GOL at some point, but only for a technical review of clarity, consistency, and actionability. So if that referral is meant for anything else, it should probably be stated in the referral specifically that for a particular referral, that review is being expanded if this committee does not want, this council does not want to create a new committee in the meantime if this language weren't to be added. That, that would be my thoughts. I don't know whether that explained that clearly at all or not. I'm just not sure how we'll interpret the rule we wrote that we're presenting later tonight if we don't change your charge. So we're not, this discussion was not meant to change the charge tonight. I will state that right now it was a let's, a discussion okay. only. Um, it can certainly inform our later agenda item as that item gets discussed. Is there any further discussion on this item? Okay, then we're going to leave it as a discussion item. We're going to move on to action item 7A. This is the proposed permanent town council rules. And Alyssa and Kathy, I think the two of you are doing this. Let me also say this is a committee, as many of you have, that has also worked very hard to get to this day. Thank you for that. Alyssa. Thank you. And so Kathy once again made these slides because she's amazing and I really appreciate that. Um, so let's also give her extra credit for the fact that she had to do a track changes even though it had like four versions and she went from one to the other and she, so it's amazing. So you need to all pull that version up right now if you're going to have any questions, either the track changes or the clean version because otherwise I'm going to talk about numbers and you're going to have no idea what I'm talking about. So we, here we are. We are almost done. We are almost ready to dump this on GOL. Um, and because then the ad hoc will be done and it'll be great. And there are some specific things that we have developed as we've done this that we've realized, you know what, we can't deal with this right now. Let's put this on a list for GOL for future. We don't know quite where we're going to maintain all these things in the future. We want to have this amazing online system where everything's linked to everything else. Let's refer that to GOL to have them figure that out. So we're, we're putting a lot on GOL's plate whether we change their charge or not at this particular moment. So next slide. Where we are is uh, apparently, yes. So we already talked about this on the 6th. 
We then at rules met on the 7th and the 14th to review your comments, to review the comments from the town manager and the clerk of the council. The track changes version eight shows all changes from the May 6th version that was presented to you at council and the clean version accepts the edits. I will not read every word on these really beautiful slides just in the interest of time. The things we wanted to draw to your attention this time, you'll remember that last time we had this very clever highlighting situation where we were like, ooh, look at this special yellow thing, and then blue point things were points of decision. Well, we've cleaned that up for this version, and so now we are just drawing your attention to, we made some decisions, and so we wanted to clarify one of the things that came up in various comments, for example, is item one here, allowing for council to amend the rules with one vote. So we didn't have to have two separate votes. It's not a bylaw, but to say we would have two separate discussions at, at town council meetings so that you didn't, if you missed one, you weren't out of luck. Um, we would also provide for public dialogue sessions at the discretion of the council. We changed it from being a requirement. This was a new thing that we were very excited to do, but we were scared of compelling it given the feedback we were getting. So we put it in there as a thing we can do at the discretion of the council. Item three, we revised the time goals for council minutes for regular meetings. As you know, we had very aspirational goals around this. We also know that there are limits to the space time continuum as well as staff time. And so we came up with a compromise there. For code of courtesy, we went around and around for a really long time and I finally withdrew and said, okay, we'll just deal with it and we'll see what happens and we'll see if the president comes back to us and says, you know, we need a rule that would be more helpful to me than what I already have here. But We'll just go with what we've got. We made clear something that's been coming up over and over again tonight in terms of committee actions not binding the council. That's in Rule 10.1. And the another thing we were really excited about, of course we're excited about every single page, but <laughs> one of the things we were excited about was this idea of study and work groups, which were different than ad hoc committees and different than district meetings and different than lots of other things. But because there are a lot of logistical concerns with how that works and we're all still getting our feet wet on how all the other required things are, we put the, we're going to refer that to GOL to address those logistical concerns to figure out how to best address those because it was still clear in the comments we got back from council that not everybody understood. We thought they were super cool, but not everybody understood what we were trying to accomplish there. So we realized we could let that go for right now. And so next steps, we're supposed to have done these permanent rules within six months of taking office. That puts us at June 3rd. That's our next council meeting. And so today's the second review. We could agree to adopt these tonight and then go ahead and dissolve rules as soon as they finish their minutes, which would be pretty quick because we've been really good about keeping up on that. Or we could drag it out to another meeting if you'd like. Um, <laughs> If you think there are substantive things that you <laughs> saw when you read this that you feel like need to be changed or addressed, then we have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow and we have a meeting scheduled for the day after Memorial Day because we love meeting every single week and we have been doing that for more than three hours for the last several weeks. So hint, hint, we could be done, but if the, we aren't done because there's something that you found in here that needs to be changed, please let us know. Are there questions? Kathy. I, I don't have a question, but could you go back one slide? I just want to emphasize the number six. Um, we got a lot of positive comments on this notion that a committee could form a group to actually think about something, not make a decision, could have non-residents. What we ran into is how and who appoints this, how many proliferate. So it wasn't removing it all. It just literally dealing with logistical. So the only yellow highlight left in rules right now is a placeholder for this. We wanted to make it clear we didn't delete it. We just took that paragraph and said, figure out how we can make this work. And we found it in a huge, quite a few towns. So lots of towns are doing this, towns and municipalities. We're not breaking new ground here. We just got enough of things like how we do you do it this way, that way. So we just moved it to a placeholder. So it's not gone for those of you. We got great comments back from counselors and a lot of comments were this was a good idea. Can I also uh, particularly thank Margaret and Paul for your intense review of this 
and you're working with us to make it even a better document. Thank you very much. Are there further comments? Yes, Andy. So I'm going to be really quick because one of the things that I really liked was the rule that we're trying to get out of here by 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, so I'll, I'll make it very simple. Uh, the suggestion was made that if we've observed things that we'd like to bring back to the committee's attention, that we be clear as to what the process is to do that, and then I won't have to mention them now. Okay. Further conversation or question? Evan? So 3.5B1, I just, the, the feedback you got from the town clerk was that that was a reasonable request to make the, all the votes public within one business day? Yes, we, we got feedback on what was feasible. Um, and it was partly because they're recording them as we're doing it, so you, it could just be a Xerox of what they have. It doesn't have to be formal. So we, we pre-tested both of those, Evan, to make sure what we were putting in for when we get minutes, but also the votes. Can, is this doable? Yeah. So that, that what would be published is actually the motions along with the votes. Any further questions? Margaret, did you need to speak to that? No, I appreciate um, the council giving us, giving the town manager and me the opportunity to review the, the draft rules and um, considering some of our suggestions. I also want to be clear for the public's information that the way councilors um, submitted their comments on the draft was through me. So councilors submitted their comments on the draft rules to me, and then I, in turn, redacted all names, all identifying information to forward it to rules of procedure. Thank you. Any further comments? I can keep going, but if other people... Sure, Evan, go ahead. Um, one, one question I have that was in a comment, um, but it was a question, so I don't know how you would respond it that way. Um, was on 10.6J. I'm not clear what the phrasing committees have the obligation to be creative means. And I, I, it's one of those things that sounds really good, but when you tell me it's an obligation, I want to know what that means if I'm obligated to do so. And I have no idea how in my role as a GOL member I can fulfill the obligation to be creative. <laughs> <laughs> we do not want him to be creative. <laughs> well. Is there a response? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I can actually remember where it came from. We found it in another town group, yeah. and we just we thought it was permissive. Um, so it may be just a wordsmithing to make sure that the notion that. Uh, you can be creative here, um, and it's both a right and we hope you will be. So we could change it to a, a, a right and an expectation that you will be creative. Um, you know, because I can understand, you know, like, was I creative? Well, I don't, I don't you, you were not creative. very... Like, you're not being creative. Yeah, I know. No, no. So, yeah, it, we, what we liked is that it, it had a sense of um, if you come up with a new and different way of doing it, feel free to say it, you know, don't mm -hmm. just try to say we've done it this way for 20 years or 15 years, think, yep. think through a different way of doing it so we can do a, a right and an expectation instead of the word. We just were wordsmithing like crazy when we were doing all the other pieces. Okay, let's hold on that one for a moment. Additional questions? Andy? Since nobody answered my first question about other ways to get things across, I'll just be real quick on what the two were that I would put in. One is on 1.6, uh, there's a very arcane wording that goes on proposed, uh, prior to final passage, prior proposed amendments shall be read at two separate meetings. I don't think that you literally are talking about just reading them. I think it's the question is whether you really mean reviewed at and whether the clarification of language would therefore serve a purpose. And the other just general topic, 
uh, gets back to my uh, um, comment before about 10 o'clock, but in rules 3.2 and 4.2, uh, I would um, urge the committee to give some consideration as to whether more clarity should be given to the presiding officer's um, options in order to adhere to the 10 o'clock uh, rule that um, we allow certain decisions to be made by the presiding officer in order to achieve that goal. I, may I speak to that? Because I did actually attend this meeting, though I'm not a member. And we, they went back and forth on this. And since the presiding officer always has the right to rearrange the agenda uh, and move items around so that you could move all action items to before 10 o'clock, it was kind of felt like this plus that privilege, if you will, was sufficient. Andy. Yeah, no, I just suggest that there would be another thing that um, the committee could consider, and that's giving the president the um, right to establish time limits for discussion of any particular item probably subject to override by the council as a whole, but that is another uh, common mechanism to move things along. Okay. So, so I want to under... Oh. Alyssa. <laughs> so we specifically heard that you said that we saw it in writing and we believed what Lynn just said in terms of we made it very clear in 4.2, unless the president or presiding officer determines a shift in order will facilitate the process of the meeting. We think that's super clear. If you want us to add a thing that says, and oh, by the way, I'm trying not to sound sarcastic, the president has the right to determine how long agenda items are, of course they have the right to do that. So I'm not really sure where we stick that, but if it's super important to a majority of the council, fine. But I think there's some things just like, for example, I said, do we want to include a rule about the fact that the president is our press spokesperson? And I was told, no, that doesn't need to be in there, even though some people would put that in their rules. I feel like this is even more so something like that, that of course I understand that the presiding officer gets to determine if we talk about this for five minutes or 20 minutes, subject to one of the counselors saying, hey, wait, hey, wait, can we talk about it more? Further comment? Evan? I have three more, so I can do them one by one. Or okay, go uh, right ahead, so, please. So uh, 10.7a, um, this is a question I had last time we talked about these, and I, I don't feel like I have an answer yet. Um, so for JCPC and BCG, uh, we've taken those appointments in this rule away from the president, who made them for the current committees. Um, my question is, do we anticipate, it just says the council shall vote to appoint counselors to the following committees based on interest after an initial poll to ascertain preferences. That's pretty light. Um, it sounds like it's up to the council to decide then what that process is. Is there uh, an anticipation that that is something that will go through OCA and OCA will be recommending appointees to those committees as the appointments um, body? Mandy Joe. Um, so I'll, I'll say two things. Um, to answer your direct question, no, there is no anticipation that they would go through OCA, that it would be a full council decision without necessarily recommendations from OCA specifically. Um, secondly, we're not taking it away from the president. The council voted the JCPC and BCG appointments as their own appointments when they were made because we had town attorney opinion that said the charter said that they were town council appointments, not presidential appointments. Um, we could, if the council wants, vote to make them presidential appointments, which I, we had a few comments about why not be the president and the rules committee kept them with the council, but, but we haven't taken that away from the president. But there is no anticipation that that 
process would operate through OCA, that the anticipation is that it would be at a meeting of the council where those are decided. So we'd have a poll, there'd be six people who say JCPC, and then as a council we would vote on mm -hmm. those people? What we did in the past was I um, would take that poll and I would look for balance and I would um, come forward with a recommendation and you would either accept it or amend it or whatever. So is that how Rules Committee anticipated this would work? Because that still seems to me much like a presidential appointment. Uh, we, we didn't get to that level of detail. We could have, number one, we might have three people who want to be on JCPC and there are three slots, no problem. You know, and last time for a couple slots, that was exactly the case. So we, we left it open without being prescriptive here. So, uh, you know, it's a wait and see. It was uh, trying to make sure that we didn't expand authority where it hadn't already been given. If we were in a situation where there were people ready and eager to serve, that we could have a discussion about it. So we've left it open the way it's worded right now. Uh, so uh, 8.2a, uh, the council shall specify a time period for a committee to report back. Um, so uh, the, the expectation then is every time we refer to a committee, we're giving them a hard deadline of when they have to get back. Um, is that the expectation? Yeah, we saw that comment. <laughs> uh, it, yes, we could tell that one, even though the names were stripped off. What we said was, make sure I got this right, is that we said, yes, we shall specify a time period. That time period could be whenever you feel like it. That time period does not have to be a certain date. It could be a period of time. It could say before we're ready to do the next thing. It doesn't have to be a specific date, and it doesn't have to be like, and we specifically didn't put in like 60 days. Like We chose not to do that. We just said we should choose when we do that. And if our choice is to say, we don't really care when it is, but we shouldn't forget to address that issue. We should address the issue in some fashion. I would just like to add that the committee fully expects the report could be something as simple as the committee hasn't been done yet and hasn't finished yet. But it's, it's a way to make sure it hasn't been, that referral hasn't been forgotten. It doesn't have to be, we're done with it. It could be, we're not done with it yet, but we haven't forgotten about it. Right. And your next question? Uh, the last thing is I, I did want to say that um, I know I'm in the minority here in saying this, um, but the decision to remove those present shall not engage in demonstrations of approval or disapproval still makes me very nervous. Um, I, I know that we like to think that clapping is fun and we like to be celebrated, but I think it's very important to recognize that there are sides to every issue and that one person's celebration is one person's is another person's loss. My concern is, and I'm just revealing what, which comments were mine for rules and procedure because I don't care if you know they were from me. Um, my, my particular concern is not necessarily clapping with regard to actions of the council, um, but perhaps from other things that could occur. And so if you have a contentious issue and you have a, let's say there's, I don't know, a hypothetically an affordable housing thing in front of us and a public commenter speaks in strong opposition against that and gets roaring applause from the audience um, who is in agreement, someone who's sitting in the audience who might be thinking they're going to speak in support may then reconsider. I think it changes the atmosphere of the room. I think it changes the character of the debate. And I don't think that just putting it on a posted agenda is sufficient. I think that we need to have it in the rules so the, pres the presiding officer can use her authority to say. Because in here it just says uh, that disturbs or impedes. That's sort of loose. If you just finish a public comment and people clap, that's not impeding because someone else is coming up. It's not disturbing the order of the council, um, but it does change the atmosphere of the room. And I think that people who maybe are in the minority in the office who might speak, who might want to voice their opinion, may be, be then dissuaded from doing so. Are there other comments? Questions? Yes, Dorothy. Um, just to respond to that, um, democracy is sometimes messy, but I hate to preempt the public's right to respond. Are there other comments, questions? Pat. Um, I agree with um, not having the applause for the very same reason that you're talking about, that there are always two, maybe four sides, five sides to an issue. 
Um, my concern is um, that, you know, I think that's saying uh, enough. I just, I, I feel very strongly that we give the public time during public comment periods to uh, respond. We get emails from them and phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think they need to celebrate or mourn here publicly. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Andy. The uh, rule the town meeting had against public demonstrations really worked very well at town meeting and I think preserved an atmosphere of mutual respect um, amongst the body and uh, just point that out as to reason to adhere to that. Okay, further comments? I hate to say it, ROP, but I think you got to go back and come back. Uh, addressing the issues, there was a few word tweaks. I only have one. I have uh, the creative one. I don't Kathy? have any other that need well, to be changed. The, this, the, and this one that has just been brought up. So we I'm have. Sorry. Well, no, because. Okay, wait. Okay. All right, hold on. Kathy, you've been taking notes, and Alyssa, you've been taking notes. And Alyssa, you say you have the creative one. Oh, that's all I have is 10.6J. And Kathy? Yeah, so I have some wording, so right in expectation. Uh, Andy's on archaic. We, we can review at two meetings. I mean, these are, these are pretty simple word changes. So um, the presiding officer issue, time limits, we think we've given you those. I don't think we have to write it in, so I'm not... The only one I really heard is there's still discomfort about not saying uh, that we don't want public demonstrations. Um, one alternative we had thought is that the agenda itself would have a please refrain from public demonstrations kind of comment on it, you know, limit your comments to three minutes, but we didn't want to just put a kibosh on it. So that's the only real substantive one I heard. The others are we can edit and have it come back for adoption with those changes in it. But those are the only ones I heard. I, I still only heard the creative one. The arcane language we didn't necessarily agree was a change we needed to make, and I didn't hear any agreement around adding in anything about time limits. So the only thing I heard was creative and then this discussion that we're having again that I withdrew about demonstrations. I'm not seeing any other changes to be made. I think it's up to everyone in the room whether... Do we yeah. want the Steve, committee Steve to go? Got, oh, Steve. A comment. Yeah. Madam President, would yes. you consider a motion to approve? Uh, yes, but then we're also going to have to deal with that creative issue. Um, I think I have a... Cre uh, well, I move, I move to it. I move, to approve. I move to approve. Okay, let's have a, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? There is a motion in written okay. here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, the motion as it is, is um, to, to adopt the proposed town council rules of procedure entitled Amherst Town Council Rules of Procedure Draft, May 14th, 2019, as recommended by the Rules of Procedure ad hoc. Is there a second? Pat, any further conversation on that? Yes. I would recommend that we either quickly wordsmith the creative thing, or we accept it the way it is, and we say, someday GOL <laughs> can, can address a different sentence for that and just move on. I'm so, sorry. I, Mandy Jo. I would go with, we're already potentially in the next motion if this one passes, sending 11, 10, 11, maybe 12 things to GOL. Let's just add this obligation to be creative to that list and then GOL can come back with a laundry list of rules changes to okay. what we just adopted. All right. So we're, 
I don't think we need a motion to add that to your list. So the motion on the floor is to adopt the rules of, the, of procedure ad hoc committee is recommended. Is there, there's been a made a motion and a second. Any further conversation? Yes, Evan. I, I actually think I would like to offer an amendment to 6.2D to add the language that was struck, those present shall not engage in demonstrations of appro approval or disapproval back into the rules. Okay, so there is an amendment. I second. Okay. And any further conversation on this? Can you just be more specific as to where that's going to go? If, if I could just ask the question, are we going, which version are we going back to and is it audible or not audible? We've had several variations. Go ahead, Evan. So I was looking specifically at the lined out in red text, those present shall not engage in demonstrations of approval or disapproval. To me, that means broad demonstration. I would, audible, not audible, signs, whatever. If people would prefer it be audible, I would be amenable to that. Audible got removed at one point. That's why you see that. Yeah, that. Okay. The motion right now, please repeat it, is that we restore the sentence that says, Evan. Those present shall not engage in demonstrations of approval or disapproval. And there's been a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Call the question on that one. That is to add it back in to the rules of procedure. All those in favor? Opposed? Steve, were you counted as in? Yes. In favor? Okay. Opposed? And then there's one absent. So that passes eight to four and one absent. Okay. Now we're back to the original motion, which is to adopt the proposed town council rules of procedure entitled Amherst Town Council Rules of Procedure Draft May 14, 2019 as recommended by the Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. Is there any further conversation? As now amended. As now amended. I'm, thank you very much. As now amended. Any further conversation? All those in favor? And that is 12 with one absent. Uh, the second motion is to refer the Amherst Town Council Rules of Procedure draft May 14, 2019, adopted by the Town Council on May 22, 19, to Governance Organization and Legislation Committee for a review of form, content, and organization with a report back to the Council. Is there a motion? Pa Kathy, is the motion second? I will second that. Okay, Evan is second. Any further conversations on that, Mandy Jo? I'd like clarity on this motion. Um, is this just so that it's sitting in rules in GOL just in general, or is this specifically for a declaration of clarity, consistency, and actionability? Because, um, well, we just passed it, number one. But number two, at um, our May 8th meeting, GOL unanimously voted that the final recommendations of the ad hoc rules of procedure committee do not need to be referred to GOL prior to council action for that declaration. Um, so if it's just to formally sit these rules in GOL on a sort of ongoing basis, great. But if it's specifically for us to go back through them for that clarity consistency, GOL has pre-voted that we don't need to do that. And my guess is just to sit in the committee and with the items that were left um, in a referral would at some point you might want to choose to come forward with them. Yeah, and you know, at least some of what we thought, what well, it's missing a table of contents right now is, you know, uh, hot links. There's some design features that need to happen to it before so, it gets posted. So there is some consistency issues. Yeah, just 
I mean, I, we can tomorrow add the t table of contents. We, we needed contents to settle down before we created one. <laughs> so. Okay, I'm trying to decide. We just passed these, which basically means your committee doesn't have to meet again. So now it actually goes to GOL, and are we asking GOL to, in fact, finish up the format and consistency? Evan. My understanding of the motion was that there was a report from, I believe, Mandy Joe of outstanding rule issues that rules did not get a chance to cover. Um, it, it seemed to me that this would my initial assumption of this motion was that it would be essentially we're now taking over rules. The wording of the motion does seem to suggest what Mandy Joe said of a GOL review. So perhaps the wording of the motion just needs to be edited if we were all assuming it was the former. How would, please, Alyssa. How is the motion? for, given where we are now, and given what we heard from GOL. So we're looking at our motion sheet. We passed the first motion. How are motions two and three related? Can we just go with the third one and just not need the second one anymore? Because it, it looks to me like the material that was also in your packet, right, the 11 items listed um, for consideration and report back to the council, that's referring that to GOL, but, I mean, like, Kathy said, we'll finish now that we know what the table of contents is, we'll tell it to create the table of contents. But beyond that, I don't think GOL needs the rules to do something to now to make them final. They just reside with them in the future. But the, what they do need is that third part. So Margaret, third. your thoughts? Uh, I think the two can be combined. Um, you could do number three and then just do GOL's regular work. There might be some minor grammatical things that you want to clean up, maybe a few formatting issues. The two could be combined. So are we withdrawing the, the second motion? Okay. The people that made that motion? I, I think I made that motion, so I will withdraw it. Okay. All right. So then we're moving on to the next motion. Thank you for that clarification. Um, this is to refer to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee, the actually 12 items listed in the May 20, 2019 Town Council Agenda Packet document entitled Rules Recommendations for GOL, Haneke e EM 058019 revised AVB 051619 for consideration and a report back to the council. <coughs> Is there a motion? Yes. Kathy. Yes. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Let me note friendly amendment that it's 12 and the word okay. creative is added to that list. Is there further conversation? So I would just comment, even though I created this document and it had a title of recommended for follow-up of GOL, that the first one on the list might more properly reside in OCA. The first one on the list is create and recommend a document meant for the public that describes the different ways to participate in town government and particularly council matters. That one to me appears more appropriate for OCA than GOL since they are the outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. So could you just send it to us later? <laughs> just, just take it and say, and by the way, number one belongs to you. I agree with that. For the time being, would you please take this, and if you feel that there are issues that after your review, et cetera, need to come back to the council or on to another committee, we'll be glad to do that in the meetings. Is there any further discussion? Yes, Evan. Out of curiosity, per our new rule 8.2a, do we need to specify a time that GOL has to report back? As we said, we shall do. 45 days is the typical in the rules 8.2 or something <laughs> is 45 days. Then I make a friendly amendment in 45 days. Good. Is that accepted by the people who made the, men, made the motion and... Per, a second did it? Yes. yes? Yes. Okay. 
to refer to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee the 12 items listed in the May to May 20th, 2019 Town Council Agenda Packet document entitled Rules Recommendations for GOL Haneke EM 0508-19 revised AVB 0516-19 for consideration and report back to the Council in 45 days. Any further discussion? Alyssa? Margaret, help me out here, but I, I don't think we can say there are 12 items listed in a document that includes 11 items. We say as amended, the 11 items as amended. As amended, thank yeah. you. Is there any further conversation, technical or otherwise? Okay, all those in favor? And that is 12 voting for, one absent. And the final is to dissolve the Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. Is there a motion? Is there, a, Pat, the, Pat made the motion, is there a second? Shalini made the second. Is there further conversation? Let me also say with deep gratitude. Any further conversation? All those in favor? Should we designate someone to approve the final minutes? before we dissolve the committee. And Alyssa Brewer will, will approve the final minutes. <laughs> Punishment, right, I get it. Um, because we're meeting tomorrow. I mean, rule. Why are you meeting? Well, I mean, we have a posted meeting. We'd have to cancel it. So, I mean, the public would expect us to be there. So we could literally just go there. I mean, we're going to, otherwise, we're going to tell them to post cancellation. Well, then we're not going to dissolve you. Can we say that we're dissolved after we finish the minutes? Okay. How's that? Uh, okay. The, Let me try another amendment for Pat to, this is a friendly <laughs> minute. Dissolve the rules of procedure ad hoc committee after their meeting on May 21st. And this person that seconded, yes. Is there anything else? All those in favor? <laughs> Opposed, none. It's 12 uh, in favor, um, one absent. Okay. The introduction of the proposed local campaign finance bylaw. We have a, pre a slide on this, and there is the intent that this be referred. I want to note that it's after 10 o'clock and I'm yawning. Um, okay. Evan and Mandy Joe both developed bylaws. I asked them to get together. They did. And then a f bylaw was forwarded to the uh, town attorney. We've got an opinion back on that with some minor tweaks, but nevertheless, this is the first time this has come before the council. Um, Evan? I think the plan yeah. is for uh, Mandy Jo and I to introduce this a little bit. I'll speak a little bit to the rationale. Mandy Jo will speak to the actual bylaw itself. I'll try to be brief. I know we're tired. Thank uh, you. And I know you're tired of hearing me tonight. Uh, so I think that, you know, Amherst is in this exciting period where we have uh, a new government and we have new elections. And so we just went through the first round of those new elections with the town council. We'll have our second round of new elections in November, uh, which will be the first time that we have the entire school committee and the entire library board of trustees up for re-election or uh, those seats will be up for election at the same time. And then in November 2021, we'll have our final stage of these new elections, um, which is when we'll have everyone up at the same time under ranked choice voting. Uh, and so I think this is a good time for us to think about how we do elections and whether we're doing them effectively. Uh, and so within that conversation, uh, Mandy Joe and I are bringing forth this proposed uh, campaign finance bylaw that will apply to local Amherst elections only. Uh, and the reason for this, or at least my reason for this, is twofold. Uh, one is that I think that there's an interest in a lot of people in breaking down barriers to entry to, to local government and encouraging 
people to get involved. And I know that uh, fundraising can often be viewed as an obstacle for people, and that can be something that's very intimidating. I know as someone who had never run for elected office before, when I decided to run, my first hesitation um, that was probably the biggest hesitation that almost kept me out of running was, am I going to be able to raise enough money against people who are well-established, who have networks already existing? And so uh, that's something that I dealt with, and I think any new candidate will be dealing with uh, that question of can I compete with people who perhaps already have existing donor networks. And I think that problem is especially compounded when we're looking at uh, people who come from underrepresented groups or traditionally marginalized groups um, who might not have networks of donors that have a whole lot of money. Um, and so part of this is looking at uh, can we reduce the importance of money in these elections so that we break down a barrier to entry. Uh, the second part of the rationale is that right now our campaign finance limits, contribution limits, are governed by state statute. Uh, and those apply evenly to every community in the Commonwealth, with the exception of Northampton, who has their own local campaign finance ordinance. Um, that means that people running for local office in Amherst have the same limits as people running for local office in Boston. Uh, and that doesn't really make sense to me. I, I looked it up, um, and it's in the FAQ, if you all read that, that uh, I think the, the top uh, vote getter for at large in Amherst got 4,000 plus votes. The top vote getter at large in Boston got about 60,000 votes. So it just takes a lot more votes in Boston. We're very different. And so it doesn't make sense that people running for city council in Boston are subjected to the exact same ones, uh, the exact same campaign finance limits that we are here um, and Amherst, given that we have a much smaller universe of voters to contact. And so I think given those two things, um, it, it made sense to bring forth, uh, to, to, to localize campaign finance for local elections, uh, to bring Amherst campaign finance limits, I think, more in line into our values with regard to bar breaking down barriers to entry, um, and, and more feasible uh, for what we actually see elections look like in Amherst, and I'm happy to take any questions on the rationale, but I think I'd, I'd right now I'd hand it over to Mandy Joe to talk about what the bylaw actually is. Thanks, so the bylaw is three, oh, can you go back to that one? Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> the bylaw is actually three sort of parts. Um, the first part has two separate parts to it. Um, this bylaw we modeled on Northampton's, so we didn't come up with most of this language ourselves, we just copied it from Northampton. Um, but this part limits the amount that individuals and PACs can contribute to a candidate or a candidate committee running. So um, an individual would be limited to, instead of the current state law limit of 1,000 to 250, and it's shown as a, a 0.25 of the maximum aggregate, so one quarter of the state limit so that it goes up any time the state goes up so we don't have to revisit it every so many years or whatever. Um, and the second part is the PACs um, organized, so local municipal PACs organized in Amherst would be limited to 0.25 of the maximum in the state, which actually ends up at, at this point, $125 per calendar year. So that's what this one would do, and that's contributions to a candidate or if they haven't formed a committee or if they have the candidate's committee. Um, so the second part, um, which will be B, so can you move on? <laughs> is um, contributions to municipal PACs. And this part would limit that to, again, one quarter of the state maximum. Um, and that would also be, and this is individuals giving to a municipal PAC. And that would be $125 a calendar year under the current law. But again, it's tagged to the current law so that if the current law changes, this one changes automatically. Um, and the third part, part C, is the enforcement section. Um, because the state has its own enforcement for state laws, if we want any teeth to this, we had to write in an enforcement. And so this enforcement goes to the town clerk inspecting the reports that the municipal candidates, committees, and PACs have filed. Um, and if there is a violation of either section one or two, the clerk notifies the appropriate candidate or committee, um, and they have 15 days to essentially return the excess contribution or donate that to a local charity that is operating in Amherst. Um, and then 
If they don't do that, they would be subjected to a fine, and this one says not exceeding $250. This is something that if it's referred to GOL, the town attorney's opinion said that it couldn't be a not exceeding, it has to be a specific amount. So that would be something that would need to get changed under the review for actionability. Um, but for purposes of now, this is what was proposed, so that's why we still have it here, but that is a change that would, we would be looking at. Um, but we've proposed a $250 fine, essentially, or up to $250, and so that could be something we could discuss. Any, f any further from either Evan or Mandy Jo? Comments? Uh, Dorothy. Um, I, first of all, if this is for the public, I think it has to be worded in a way that the public could understand it with examples. But I would agree to this if it said, goods and services as well as money, because there you can make a contribution of goods and services worth way more than $125. And um, it's not a level playing field if you don't include give, uh, goods and services donated by, say, a PAC. Evan. Uh, so uh, two things, I, I agree that the language might seem a little bit dense. It is, like I said, uh, like Randy Joe said, mostly copied from Northampton. Um, and, and we wanted to do that um, to make sure theirs has been in effect for a few years now. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we had sort of that solid ground to stand on. Um, but that is the reason that I included, and I would hope to include for the public, that FAQ document that you had that showed what it actually looks like when compared right. against, you know, had the crossed out lines. So that 0.25 of MGL is very confusing, but if you look at the, the chart. Um, I, I did, before I brought this forward, uh, speak to OCPA, Office of Campaign and Political Finance, about whether this included only monetary contributions or if in-kind contributions, goods and services, are included. And they said that it, it, this, um, they said that these limits apply also to in-kind contributions. So it would be both monetary and in-kind. Okay. Further, Alyssa. So I, I think it's. I'm surprised that we're not mentioning that Northampton's limit is 500, not 250. Why, when we keep bringing Northampton up as an example, are we talking about doing half as much as Northampton, which has had 500 for several years? Because, of course, they did it right when the state moved to 1,000. They said, let's keep ours 500. That was their choice. 250 is a lot less than 500, and I'm not trying to understand what the justification is there, given that it hasn't been mentioned. I don't yes, know what Evan's you. thoughts were, but my thoughts were to make it slightly smaller. Um, Northampton also has a mayoral election, um, which provides for a full-time job at full-time pay for the person who wins that election. We don't have an election in a similar sense. So you could argue that a mayoral election might require or need or make more sense to have a higher contribution limit than something that is essentially a volunteer position. So that was my thoughts on making it 250 instead of 500 or one quarter instead of a half. I almost want to say to you, I don't care what Northampton does. Because <laughs> you always have to me. But, right. <laughs> Right, so Northampton was just, the, uh, they're the only other municipality that has such a bylaw, and so we just are using their text, um, so we're not reinventing the wheel. My feeling, and I did read that, my feeling was that 500 was still uh, a fairly large sum of money for our community, and so I looked for it to be lower. But of course, these numbers are, are here as our proposal, and we expect the council to give us our, their feedback. I also want to point out that this is to be referred. Yes. So questions, yes, Alyssa. So if I could just follow up again, because I really hate when Northampton gets thrown in my face too, despite my friendship with some of their counselors. I would argue that their $500 limit hasn't done anything to improve access to who runs and who doesn't. I think that it's quite clear that they don't have diverse candidates either traditionally. And so it's not that we shouldn't consider it, it's just that it's clearly not a magic bullet. And the other part of that is that, as I said during the campaign, when I did indeed, and I believe I might be almost cited in this report as being someone who did receive a $1,000 contribution, I want to explain what a rationale for that is. You don't have to agree with it, but a rationale for that is if a candidate, say for a candidate who does not have as much access as I did after many years of experience, has one or two friends with deep pockets, then they can get a really good start with that amount of money rather than saying, 
well, it's fine, we can all just have small contributions, that's actually not as accessible to somebody who's brand new as you might imagine it is because sometimes people have very uneven amounts of, of friendships in terms of where they might be able to get money from and so being able to kickstart their campaign with 500 or $1,000 and then feed in as they meet more and more people whereas somebody who already knows a ton of people isn't going to have any trouble getting tons of $250 donations. So it's just a little, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little cautious. Steve? Yeah, so my, thank you for all the work, but Alyssa said a lot of what I was thinking is I wonder if we're solving a problem that doesn't necessarily need to be, be addressed because I have done a cursory look at campaign finance reports for us and for um, school committee and it's counterintuitive, you know, it's counterintuitive who's getting, you know, um, what we might consider big donations. So, yeah. So I, I think that unless I really hit it right on is that sometimes the jump starting comes for people that need the help the most rather than the people that are the most connected. Interesting. Okay. Other comments, questions? Shalini. As a person who's new to uh, politics and no one knew me, I felt it very uncomfortable asking for any amount of money. And so it, it, I did, f I mean, and I could, I, I, I don't know, it was hard to expect anyone to give large amounts. So for me, 250 seems like a leveling, play, leveling the playing field versus you know, other people's capacity to get thousands of dollars. So it does, I don't know. It's, it's tricky the way I, I hear what some of the other people are saying. Um, Dorothy. Does, does this limit the amount that the candidate can give to uh, his or her own campaign? It does not. Well, then that's not a very level playing field, is it? So there's a Supreme Court decision out there that says that candidates have unlimited ability to give themselves unlimited money as a free speech issue, so we couldn't actually limit the amount a candidate can spend on themselves for a campaign. Interesting. Okay. Other questions? Thoughts? Okay. Who do we think this should be referred to? Rules. Rules committee. <laughs> the rules committee for the meeting tomorrow. One day more. One day more. I really don't want to make this an ad hoc committee, gang. Um. It's a bylaw. Let's go to GOL. Yes, Mandy Can I Joe. say, the, since it is a bylaw, the clarity, consistency, actionability under the rules we just adopted automatically comes to GOL. The question is, where does the substance, the policy type review fall? Um, it can come back to the council. For the pros and cons, though, I mean that's what we have CRC for for certain things. Where should this one be? That that's the question I have, and that doesn't under GOL's charge fall under GOL. I I agree with Lynn. This is a matter for the whole council. Meaning it would go to GOL for consistency, et cetera, and then it would come back to the council, and if the 13 of us can't ourselves voice the pros and cons, then who are we exactly? We're all experts in raising money, so. <laughs> Pat? Uh, when it goes to GOL, do Evan and Andy Joe have to stay out of it, recuse themselves since they wrote it? No. No. Any further conversation about that? Does anybody feel that we need to have an additional committee for this? No. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. The motion then would be to refer the limitations of campaign contribution bylaw introduced by Councillor Haneke and Ross on May 20th, 2019 to the GOL committee with a report back to the Town Council on June 3rd, 2019. Is there a motion? So moved. A second? second. George, comment. Andy. Why does it need to be that quick? I think the idea is to put it into place before the fall election. Mandy Joe. So as a bylaw, it will need read at two meetings, and this is not counting as that read because we want the first reading to be after any changes might be made to it. It needs read at two separate meetings, and then after passage at, if it passes at that second meeting, it will not become effective for 14 days. Evan and I would love to see this in place for the fall election period, and papers be, are available on July 1 for that. So if a recommend, well, there's no recommendation if it goes to GOL, because GOL is just declaring clear consistency and actionability. It will not come back with a recommendation. So our thing is to have that declaration done by June 3rd, I guess. Um, but the if you bring it back for the first reading on June 3rd, the second reading can be on the 17th, and it will become effective on the 30, the, on July 1 directly, um, which would allow it to be effective from the first day that papers can be pulled for the fall election. Andy. So let me just ask the president what she anticipates uh, happening with the budget discussion on June 3rd. A lot of time. <laughs> it's, it is the major agenda item. This would be probably the only other substantive one, but I would look at that quite carefully. Um, or can I say something? Absolutely. Dorothy. Um, I don't think that this campaign finance rule is going to accomplish what we want to accomplish, but I think that we could look into, and I don't know, the possibility of the town providing more assets to candidates. Uh, right now, I believe candidates get a free copy of the uh, voter list, do they not? So that's one thing they get free. Um, some towns have something which ours does not, which is a list of email addresses of voters, which would be really great, because um, that's really like one of the big problems. But I mean, there may be other things that the town can do, even maybe a workshop uh, for candidates. How do you run for office? How do you fill out the papers? I mean, because we do need a lot more outreach, but I don't think this is gonna solve it, um, in getting us more candidates from other places. Okay, Evan? I, I do just want to clarify that I have no expectation that this singular bylaw will be a silver bullet. I think that there are a number of things that we need to do as a council over the coming years to try to make our local elections stronger um, with, with more, more people coming in. Um, but I do think that this is one piece of the equation. And so there, there are certainly many pieces that I would hope that this council will discuss over the coming years. Dorsey. Yeah, I would just say um, that if you're still in the process of amending this, uh, I would agree with what Dorothy said about uh, goods and services. And I know you said that this was included, but um, somehow or other, there would need to be a way of attaching a value to something like um, uh, phone lists, um, mailing lists, and um, a lot of the different things that if you get them in your campaign, they are a very powerful tool and they, you know, make the, make the playing field uh, level if everyone has them. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I see that as a bigger problem than the uh, campaign contributions, the amount of 
training that might be offered or website help or mailing lists, that type of thing, if that could be made level, that would be extremely helpful. And if somehow or other this could, could assign a value to that type of thing, that would be helpful. Further, Alyssa. Except I don't think it can. Office of Campaign and Political Finance decides if a mailing list is worth money or not, depending on where it comes from. Office of Campaign and Political Finance decides what websites are worth or not. Many candidates don't have to pay for websites and don't have to count them as in-kind contributions because of the profession of the person who's providing them. And those are all Office of Campaign and Political Finance decisions. So while we can make a new dollar amount, that dollar amount can't suddenly redefine what mailing list means or what a PAC means. You can say a PAC only gets this much money, but you can't redefine a PAC to suit Amherst, and you can't redefine what an in-kind contribution is to suit Amherst. Those rules are still Office of Campaign and Political Finance rules. So I don't, you probably don't agree with some of those rules, but I don't think we can fix those ourselves, but we can address the money. That's something we can address. There's a motion on the floor and it's been seconded. And that motion is to refer this to GOL and have them report back by June 3rd. Is there any further conversation? All those in favor? It's unanimous except for one absence. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't see, opposed. Opposed? No. Abstain? Two. So it was 10 in favor, two abstain, one absent. Okay. At this time, I'm going to not do the president's appointment to the community resource committee. We have had a resignation from that committee as Sarah Schwartz, and there are at least two, if not more, people interested. Um, so it remains an open seat. I encourage people to attend the meetings, and whenever they are going to be doing general um, discussions, like the one that they did on zoning and the one that they did on um, uh, planning, please know that they will be posted as committees of the whole. Um, committee reports. Bylaw review, Pat? Microphone, please. Okay. <laughs> um, we've worked on the wetlands protection bylaws, collecting and dealing in used articles. We've wa worked on the violation of refuse collection and recyclable materials bylaw, and the disposable of refuse, rubbish, et cetera, on highways or any public land. And we've talked about the bylaws uh, around parades and public meetings, and we deferred our discussion on signs. But you have asked for something to be on the agenda. They're moving her off, thank you. A community Resource Committee, Steve. So the main action item that we had was the Airbnb recommendation that I reported on earlier. Other than that, we've had two workshops that have both been open to the whole town council, one on the master plan, one on uh, planning and zoning. So we were supposed to meet on Wednesday, but I've got a message that a, our meeting wasn't posted. So that means we're not meeting on Wednesday, okay. So if you're on the CRC, um, we won't be meeting this Wednesday, so stay tuned for a reschedule. Yep. And I believe you're not meeting the following Wednesday because of the conflict with the, um, with the chamber event and also now the food event at the schools. Uh, okay. I leave it to the chair and vice chair to poll. Could I ask a question about that? Um, I was really looking forward to seeing the CRC meeting on video, and I'm wondering if uh, that the the zoning um, that was a, commit, a meeting it was of the a whole, committee of right? the whole. So, 
Uh, I don't think it's on Amherst Media, and so I wondered if it's going to be on the YouTube channel. It or? would be on the it would be on the YouTube channel. It'd be on the town's YouTube channel if it was recorded. So the question was, was there if the committee recorded? Yeah. So okay. the May eighth meeting isn't up yet. Okay. I'm waiting expectantly to watch that one. Mm -hmm. okay. That would be on the master plan. May 8th was the master, master plan. plan. And then there was one on the, the yeah, last so those two are not, are not up yet. So um, I have them on my list. The weather's nice. Okay. All right. Any questions? Yes, so, Alyssa. I'm sorry. Um, in regards to bylaw review, I just so that nobody's surprised if they are, if you all, which I certainly hope you all, subscribe to meeting notices and you often see the planning board agendas. So on May 29th, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Bob Ritchie, the chair of bylaw review, is going to point out to the planning board that remember how you looked at the zoning bylaw back in December with the previous bylaw review group? Oh, we're going to need you to do that again because it's just updating just a couple really basic things in the zoning bylaw so that they can have a hearing. They're also going to have a hearing, which the legal notice must have already gone out for, for June 3rd, just so that they can then give the town council a report about those very basic changes. These are not extensive changes at all, because then that way they can have a nice, clean zoning bylaw to work from as they're doing all their zoning bylaw thing, rather than trying to bring us a piecemeal bylaw here and there that's based on the old zoning bylaw. Would you please so. provide that information to Margaret, who can then send it to the full council? Thank you. Um, Council Goals Ad Hoc Committee, we are meeting this Thursday. However, we have not received that many things back from people, so this is not going to be our last meeting. We do remind you that we do need your full, your full set of activities, et cetera, um, and any changes that you have in the actual goals. Finance Committee? Well, the Finance Committee is really in its uh, extremely busy season, which includes the hearing tomorrow, which I hope that uh, as tired as we all are tonight, that the Council as a whole, since it is posted as a Council meeting, will uh, attend. We don't know, again, the amount of public that will be there. We're, it, it's a hearing. It's not a, a forum, so we're not limited by the time constraints. Uh, but we are uh, trying to organize it to do it as expeditiously in time as we can, but to serve the purpose of encouraging and allowing the public to comment on the budget and its priorities. Uh, I think I'll save the discussion of what the committee has been working on in the review process and do that in our uh, report that we're going to have to be submitting um, very soon. Uh, so I think that that's the uh, major points. And I guess the other thing is just to uh, reflect back on the point that you made. Um, I don't think the Finance Committee is going to be able to get to um, back to the goals question until it completes its work on the budget. I would agree with that. Okay. Uh, GOL? Amanda Joe? Nothing except what's in the report, so read it if you haven't. Um, OCA, Sarah, or Alyssa? Along, we have an extra, we have a scheduled an extra meeting because meeting today wasn't enough on Wednesday the 22nd where we'll be talking about ranked choice voting participatory budgeting that information's already been posted you look for it on the actual meeting posting so that we can get it to the next council meeting and rules of procedure I think we've done that one um, I'm want to make a motion to approve the minutes of May 6th and May 8th the special meeting um, so the motion is to approve the May 6th Town Council meeting minutes and the May 8th Town Council special meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Further conversation, discussion, corrections, additions? All those in favor? Opposed, abstain, and one absent.
Okay. Um, Mr. Bachman, your report. Yes. Um, two things I want to bring to your attention. One is uh, you, you have my report, which you can read, I'm sure you've all read and memorized. Um, first thing I want to mention is how the com community participation officers have been so active in the community. I've tried to list some of the things that they've done. Uh, they're insatiable in the, times, the types of things that they want to engage the public in. So I really commend them for their work. Um, all three of them have been aggressive about trying to reach out and be creative and thinking about things. And uh, so I just commend them on that work. The second one is a focus on DPW. Earlier today, you saw uh, our Assistant Superintendent Amy Rusecki with the um, uh, citation from the governor. It's re I think it's very impressive for a town our size has the president of the Mass Water Works Association, someone who's recognized throughout the state for her leadership on water issues. And I think that really speaks highly to the quality of our staff. Um, we, and so she received that for Drinking Water Week. Uh, we also received a top, we were one of the top 10 uh, communities in the country for a complete streets um, policy, which is another, uh, that's a, and that's from a neutral organization that support, supports complete streets. Uh, we are also being recognized for being Tree City USA again and our commitment to uh, trees. And uh, this week is Public Works Week. You will see through our social media that every day we're featuring a different division and talking a little bit about the types of work that our DPW does. Um, often unheralded, often un underappreciated, often the source of criticism because their jobs are on the streets every day in front of people who get to watch them work all day. And I'm glad I'm in an office or in, in some place in an office where people aren't watching me all day. So I commend them for all their work. Um, big paving projects happening west, uh, East Pleasant Street, as soon as the weather lets up, that will be um, paved. Uh, west Bay Road is pretty close to being finished. There's some uh, touch up things. Main Street, we have honored the request of local businesses to not be interfering with their business, their busiest months of the year, which are April and May. So when, the, when once we get beyond um, Memorial Day, they'll be down there as, as long as the weather holds. Um, Bridge opening, the Mill Street Bridge is open. Uh, it's going to look funny to you if you haven't seen it, and there's a reason for it, and it's going to be cleaned up once we have the official turnover from the state. And that will, it looks like it's a two-way street for a certain section, but it's just all these little things the state on ADA and stuff like that that the state had to do. We're hoping for a ribbon cutting, sort of a small affair, you will all be invited to it. Probably we're shooting for next week so we can shake hands with the state and say thank you for this beautiful new bridge. And it is really, it's big, it's beautiful, it looks great. And we appreciate that they spent all the money to build it for us. Um, and on the Station Road Bridge, that bridge we're hoping will be delivered in the next uh, week or two. Uh, then it will be a matter of putting it into place and, and building the road up. So, you know, I previously I had told you May 31st by the end of the month, um, may not quite hit that. That was my optimist. I should have given you my pessimistic date, but um, I think we'll be pretty close to that. Uh, if we go over it, it won't be very much farther than that. So basically, I um, want to thank our DPW for all the work. They're, they're, this is a really busy time of year. Um, and so if I'm ready for any questions, if you have any. Questions? Okay. Um, hearing none, thank you very much. Uh, town Council comments, let me just start with two. Um, I am in the process working with um, previous work that both Alyssa and Andy have been part of, and that is looking at a calendar for the evaluation of the town manager. Um, and then I actually have already asked OCA if we can have that on their June 3rd agenda, and I will also be posting it on our June 3rd agenda for the council to show you the calendar and also the, in general talk about the process, but briefly since we're also going to be doing the budget. Uh, the reason that we need to look at this is because um, it's a rather complicated process, it involves councilor comments, public comments, uh, staff comments, and uh, committee comments as well, and then meshing it all together. Um, it basically, at this point, mimicking 
the uh, work that has been done by the select, the process that's been used by the select board in the past, but in addition to that, looking at the process that's been used by several other towns um, that have a council manager form of government. Uh, and then the, I also still owe you a list of future agenda items. I just didn't get to it, Pat. <laughs> Sorry. Um, are there future agenda items that I, uh, you would like to add to the ongoing list? I, so I, I wanted to have a discussion and propose um, increase the, changing the charge for the CRC committee to increase the number of members, members to six because the scope of the committee is so vast that um, I think we would benefit from having uh, a larger committee with six members. Okay. Agenda. Okay. Uh, comment? Anything briefly that you would like to mention to us about your statewide committee? This hour? Um, the town manager actually covered it in his report. Basically, social consumption, I'm really excited about being able to be at the table to have that discussion with some, with some of the commissioners and with other municipal officials so that we could talk about our actual lived experiences associated with social consumption with alcohol and how that might apply to marijuana cannabis use. However, it is a very long road ahead. And so even if the Cannabis Control Commission votes at their next meeting, which is at the end of the month, to include it in regulations. The regulations still have to be published, then get comments on those, hearings on those. I plan to attend a hearing in Springfield. There's also one in Boston. And even if it makes it all the way through that process, there's still a legislative fix that has to happen. Then communities have to decide whether or not they'd be interested in pursuing that legislative fix to actually opt in. So this isn't going to happen next week, not even for Christmas, but it's something that Amherst has been in the forefront of since back when medical first came along. We were very up in front with our zoning bylaws, and so we're just trying to keep our hand in to make sure that anything that might affect Amherst actually has some input from Amherst, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you individually. Thank you. Any other councilor comments? Uh, I, I have a question about that. I uh, quickly read the report and saw that um, th there seems to be no clear way yet uh, for police to determine a, a amount of driver impairment from uh, cannabis use. And there were some members of the committee that were um, not voting for the uh, social consumption lounges until that is done. Do you know where the science is on that at this time? At this time, there is nothing that measures impairment. It only measures consumption. It only measures that you have actually used marijuana at some point. It doesn't say how impaired you are by that, as opposed to alcohol, where there have been numerous studies done that say if you blow X amount, that means that you are technically impaired. But bearing in mind that, of course, people are driving impaired with marijuana use right now, even as we speak, and they the, the police can pull people over for impaired driving right now for having too much NyQuil, to met not enough sleep, you know, for various other reasons, but it's absolutely true that there is not a measurement available that's like alcohol. Are there any other counselor comments? Uh, yes, Evan. I just wanted to briefly say, uh, since our last meeting, Steve and I held our first district meeting, and so I just wanted to thank the community participation officers who were really essential in putting that together, uh, and especially Angela Mills, who attended and made sure we had all the technical support and all the supplies. Uh, it was really a, a great help, and I appreciate the work that they did. And let me make note that with District 4 having their district meeting, every one of us has had at least one district meeting. We've accomplished one of the two we're required to have. Okay. We our second one the next night. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Any further comments, Darcy? I, I just wanted to say uh, to remind people if they don't have don't know already that the first meeting of the ECAC is this Wednesday. So we're very excited about that first meeting, and if you feel like coming around, it's going to be right here. What time? Uh, 6.30. 6.30. Thank you. Any further comments, questions from counselors? Okay, Kathy? I, I guess I'll, um, it, 
particularly affects North Amherst, but it affects anyone who drives up in our area. TAC is having a meeting to review potential ways of changing the intersection um, this, this week. Yes. Um, and there's an engineering report, so there'll be discussion on that. So it's, it's not just a district one, it's also a district two issue. When is that? Um, It's Wednesday at 5 o'clock, and it's in the police community room. This week, yeah. Okay, thank you. you know, and these committees don't always fly on people's radar screens, so. Right, and I, the reason I ask is because I've already been receiving comments, as we all have, regarding the intersection in North Amherst. I also personally go through it all the time. Um, anything else? Okay. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Uh, I, I move that we adjourn. Dorothy moves, yes. And second? Shalini. All those in favor? Let the record show that we are adjourning at 10.50.